Good evening and welcome to the Safety Security Transportation Subcommittee meeting. This evening we are in the George Rom Little Theater at Brockton High School. And today is Tuesday, October 10th, 2023, and the time is 6.07 p.m. I would, uh, before we establish a quorum, I'd like to read this. In addition to attending, the public can view this meeting <coughs> via television on Comcast Channel 8 and 1071 HD version and online via this link, www.youtube.com backslash the Brockton Channels. I would like to establish a quorum. Mrs. Uh, Cynthia Rivas Mendez. Here. Mr. Rodriguez. Here. And the chair, Joyce Asak, is also present. So we do have a quorum for this evening's meeting. Uh, first item on our agenda is um, a presentation by Sergeant Livingston regarding um, some of our safety measures that we're taking within our schools. Mr. Uh, Sergeant Livingston. Oh, do you have a presentation? Yep, I have a little. Good evening. I'm Sergeant Mike Livingston with the Brockton Police. I'm the liaison to the uh, Brockton School Department. I've been going on three years up here at the Brockton School District uh, being this liaison. And uh, the start of this year has been exciting and challenging at the same time. But uh, the 13 men and women that I oversee and supervise, they're up for the challenge. And uh, I'm just so you know that uh, we handle a multitude of calls uh, to handle the safety and concern needs for our many children in the school district, but along with our faculty and uh, our teachers and so on. Uh, items like motor vehicle accidents, uh, behavioral, uh, assisting with behavioral issues and therapeutic needs, uh, medical assistance, and just being an advocate and resource for our children and for our faculty. Uh, I'm excited and, and grateful that you guys have uh, reached out to me to give you an update on our uh, emergency safety uh, list and for all our schools, uh, I'm sorry, emergency safety plan for our schools, uh, how we stand with uh, hiring new officers uh, for us and then how our update with our metal detectors and uh, our cameras and likewise with our uh, radios. So uh, the first thing we'll talk about is our safety update uh, is uh, our emergency plan for all our schools. It should be known that our emergency plan is a overall comprehensive design uh, particularly to every one of our schools to, uh, to tackle or to, it, it consists of issues concerning um, uh, the floor plans, the specific characteristics of the school, a point of contact, the principals, uh, safety plans, uh, emergency situations, fire evacuations, incident command, protocols for communications, and so on, uh, not to be limited to that. And I'm happy to tell you that as the display tells you that we are 90 to 95% complete throughout the whole district. 90 to 95, that's a pretty tall task that a lot of hard work was put into it, but we only have to finalize a couple of little bit more things to uh, f finish this up and we should have that done. Uh, and it should also be noted that all our stay in place and uh, lockdown procedures are printed, posted, and practiced and along with our fire evacuations have been going on monthly and been recorded accordingly. Um, and uh, the one thing that I really want to touch on that has to be in the forefront of all our minds, one of the major challenges that we're having this year is social media school threats and threats. I'm sure just the last couple of weeks, it seemed week after week that we were tackling these. But I do want to encourage you that uh, through experience, uh, I've been up here for like three years now, and I know that these things always spike right around holidays, start of the school, maybe something that happened in in the city, and they go on and go on, and, and obviously it, it, it puts fear, strikes fear in all of our concerned parents and even students. But what I do want to stress to you that uh, through our experience and uh, our hard work with, we have IT technology, investigative tools, we collab with our faculty, they're such a great resource uh, to get to the bottom of these. Not only that, we collab also with the, the social media platforms. 
they work with us and get exigent requests to really uh, identify the culprit, if you will, uh, to get to the bottom of this to sift out. And again, like I said, these happen quite frequently. It might seem new to some folks, but I call this the, the new not fake 911 calls. But we get really to the bottom of them, but it unfortunately does take a lot of time. So that's with our safety plan and uh, major items that we really are tackling this year uh, and uh, we'll continue on. So I think this is a perfect segue. I like that picture I got up there, is where we stand with hiring more officers. Again, we tackle so many calls with our children and our teachers and, and throughout the whole city and the whole district. I mean, think about how many schools that we have. And uh, I'll give you an example of like traffic is one of our major issues. And if something comes up and one of our officers are tied up and we can't get to that traffic post, we're getting that call right away. They, where is this officer at? And unfortunately, more pressing things are needed. And that's why we need more officers to be that advocate, to be that resource. But I want to tell you that we reached out, as you'll see, to Hannah Hand's uh, consulting group, this uh, police agency, uh, consulting police agency, generated a test for us and uh, entry police level exam for us. And on April, we conducted them. They proctored the test. And we had, uh, I think, over 80 people register, but 57 people actually showed up and took the test right here in the red building at Brockton. And it was a great show out. We took the test in April. And out of all those participants, we took the top 16 scores, the top 16 scores, all those guys are all in the 90s or, or if better. And uh, from that 16, we conducted interviews and sift down and got to our four candidates that we really feel strongly about and are looking to put them in an academy. But time sensitivity is something of a fact, of a factor. Uh, the way the process goes, we have to vet them and do a background check for every every one of those. Oh, and just to tell you, we also have two alternates also, just in case something falls through. We want to be ready to have these individuals ready to hit the, uh, hit the school with us, hit the streets, if you will, so they can help, you know, and protect and serve with us. So, um, but out of those uh, four, the process is time sensitive in the fact that after they complete their background check, uh, you have to remember internal affairs with the Brockton Police has to do the background checks on the municipal side also. So they're doing double duty, doing our, vetting our guys, vetting their guys. So it is a time consuming kind of factor and getting that in. But after they complete that, we move on. They have to have a physical, a medical physical, do a, a police, I'm sorry, a physical activity test and a psych evaluation. And once they complete all those, then we can apply for an academy. And this is where the time sensitivity comes in. We have to get them in the academy within six months of the completion of those three battery of tests. If not, then th those tests will be considered invalid. We have to redo those tests to get it within that window. And we are looking at several police academies up in, I know this is going to sound like a hike, but Linfield, uh, but it's a newer academy. Uh, but we, we got to get our guys in there. Our people need them and uh, our constituents need them, our kids need them, we need them. So we're definitely hustling up to see if we can get up to Linfield. Uh, a little closer, we're looking at the MBTA Police Academy in Quincy and the Randolph Police Academy. So hopefully we can get those guys in, so. Oops, um, yep. Sergeant Livingston. So we're, we're hitting the six month mark. Um, how are we doing as far as getting them? Oh, we're fine, we're, we're fine okay. because we haven't applied yet for the academy we're still in this stage it should start rolling faster but we're still getting our background checks now that's a great question but once we get our background checks going then we can't even consider an academy till those three battery of tests are complete that's when the clock starts okay and out of the the four and then the two alternates um any females oh yes okay so we have two females on the in the four and a female in the uh, in the alternate. Okay. All right. So far, any members have any questions? Nope. Good. Okay. You can continue. 
Now, just to uh, piggyback on, uh, now we're gonna talk about metal detectors, but remember we were talking about uh, the veiled threats with the social media. And uh, one of the requests were to tweak the metal detectors. What I really wanna stress to you about our metal detectors is they are exceeding our expectations on what they've done. Uh, I have a very good working relationship with Chia Industries that produce these metal detectors to really prevent that kind of sort of weaponry coming into our schools. Uh, they work, I'm, I'm able to uh, adjust the sensitivity level to, so we can still get our kids in at a, a, a timely fashion and preventing any kind of weapons from getting on campus. And, uh, but again, they're working just as advertising. Not only are they doing the job of detecting, which the main focus is, but they're also doing a wonderful job of being a deterrent from people from potentially bringing those weapons in. And then think about this one. Think of all the fear that we have when you see those threads. I'm hoping that it'll play a part in being a uh, peace of mind to know that we have, we are actively pursuing to have these weapons not in our school. And, uh, and I, I'm so appreciative that we have so many of them just in case one goes down. Again, they're under warranty and uh, I, I really, it brings me back to my old Coast Guard days of being an electronic technician. Sometimes, you know, if it goes down, they give me direct instructions so we don't have to mail it back. It's, it's that simple. We just swap out, they'll mail me a part, swap it and put it right on and then we're up and running again. But these, these things are, Wonderfully made, durable, lightweight, portable, been able to get them over to the, uh, to the football games, use them at the basketball games, wherever we need them. So they've been really working uh, to our expectations and exceeding them. Then to continue on, uh, likewise with our radios, I've been talking to Ken Grice. I just made up this title for him, our uh, communication specialist. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he told me our radios are right where we need to be. Uh, but I do want to bring this to our attention that uh, during the operations meeting, we did bring up uh, radios and we also brought up uh, cameras and thinking of where else could we place cameras. We're still waiting for our uh, Stop the Cops Stop the Violence uh, Prevention Program grant. And if we're, we're looking to tap into that resource, or that funding, to actually uh, utilize that if we need to put a camera here or even beef up our radios. But it looks like, especially with our staffing right now, we have more than enough radios right now. Hopefully we can get our staffing up to uh, accommodate that. Oh, no, I didn't want to go that fast yet. <laughs> I did want to conclude with one thing with stating about our officers, our greatest resource. Uh, one thing that uh, I had to stress about our officers is that they are definitely dedicated to the school police and I can name five officers that declined going over to the city side and staying with the school police. And it isn't really out of altruism, but it really is out of practic being practical in this way. Our mantra obviously is to protect and serve, but uh, they really take that personal and this is where that practicality comes in. All of our officers in some form or fashion, and many of them, have children that go are in our school department in, in our schools in some way and that, and having these conversations with them I'm thinking like four of them right now they said they want to take hold and take control to protect and serve not only their kids but all the kids in our school district and just think of put this peace of mind in you that these officers are protecting their kids but your kids also they're protecting them our kids collectively. So I, I'm really appreciative to the dedicated work of them and how they have chose to stick with us. So uh, that does conclude uh, my presentation, but I do appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share with you the safety update, and I look forward to uh, keeping you updated and many more to come, okay? Before we um, get any questions, I do apologize. I want to recognize that um, Acting Superintendent Dr. Cobbs is here. Um, I was rushing to make sure we were on time. Yeah. We ran a couple of minutes late. Um, so Dr. Cobbs is also present at the facilities. Um, sorry, safety um, meeting, traffic and transportation subcommittee. So a um, couple of questions. Yeah. As far as the metal detectors, is there routine maintenance that we do to make sure we don't run into one that's not working? That's another good question, Joyce. Let's limit them. 
<laughs> but try. absolutely, because uh, I, I turn them on and weekly go through. They, they do a self-calibration, so it's not like I'm digging in and tweaking anything. They do a self-calibration, but frequently, again, for, uh, such an excellent question. Frequently, I pack my bag with various items of weapons and just, just to make sure that they're working. But I know they're working, but it's just good so I can reassure if someone asks a question like that. Yes, I frequently just went through the... Uh, the metal detectors or the weapon detectors with a tactical knife Perfect. and with a pipe, or yeah. not a pipe bomb, but simulating a pipe bomb in a firearm. Just to do that. So I know um, in the past, one of the issues we've, we've run into is there are so many doors that people can gain access to at Brockton High. So I know we're working on yeah. different ideas to try to um, work with that. Um, so I know right now we need, you know, more staffing to, mm -hmm. to help, and, and we are working on that. But um, Joyce, can I add to that? Sure, uh, absolutely. I, I saw that need, too, and we put out perimeter checks to actually have cruisers going around and logging so we can help facilitate that because I understand that is a need. We, last year we had people, bodies on doors that helped that, but we don't have that, so we have to fill in the gap, if you will, you know, and that's we're more than willing. That's why we need more officers, also. Definitely. Um, so, as far as again, we're, we're hitting the six month mark. So, these new officers, no, we're not, not going to see them till next year. Yes, we're not hitting. Oh, when you say the six month mark, since from the April. Test. Yeah, from the okay, date of the test. Right. Yeah. Perfect. I, I'm glad. Because uh, it's been like six months since yes. April. I believe it was April first. The test. It was right, either April first or seventh. It was a sad. Right, yeah. But, but to, truth be told, I, I, I've been in constant, not constant, but frequent. I just texted them to, hey, look for me. I'll be on TV. You know? <laughs> so, but I've been in communication with these guys, letting them know that, uh, reassuring them. Because I, I understand when I first got on the job 24 years, that gap from when you take the test and sometimes communications lacks. That's in even in the advancement books that one of the major issues with recruits is that lack of communication. So I doubled down talking to all four candidates, letting them know that we're still on board. This is where we're at. I do understand one is in the process of getting their background check right now. So I'm, we're, we're moving. Okay. And then... Um any of the members with any questions or comments? Cynthia. Mrs. Rivas Mendez and Mr. Rodriguez. Um, <clears throat> in regards to what you were saying about we need more officers, can you go over what kind of questions are in the test that they took, that we have the scores in front of us, and then the timeline of the hiring process? So it, it's a generic uh, entry exam. I, I had nothing to do with the test. You know, I didn't, I just uh, made sure everything, people had the parking, but they proctored the test, they generated the test, I had no influence on it, you know. I do recall uh, looking at one of the questions, and I was already intimidated by it, so, whew, I'm glad I'm already on, you know, so, but. So I, it's like, it's like based, like common sense questions, common sense, or can yeah. they study for this test? No, it's basic common sense questions that, okay. you know, sim similar to a civil service test for okay. a basic entry exam. And then can you go over the timeline? I know you said that right now you did the 16 interviews. You have four. Yes. Four that, you're, that ideally you want to move forward. Yes. And then you're looking at their physical, their background. And where are we among that timeline so, in regards to the test still being effective? So the, uh, we're at the point we're still doing the background checks. Okay. Once we complete those background checks, that's when things can really start moving. We can start scheduling the uh, PAT test, the medical exam, and then the, uh, the psych evaluation. That's once we can get the background check done, that's when things really start rolling. But you want to be cautious with that because you want to get it rolling so fast, excuse me, get it so fast that if there's not an academy ready for them, then we're kind of stuck in limbo and we have to stay within that six month period of the first start day and them completing all their battery of exams. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so that's why, so we, we're moving methodically, getting these background checks, but once that's done, it should really start layering going down fast. Okay. All right. Um, and I don't know if this question would apply to you, but I know like when we talk about traffic, especially transitions in the Brockton High School, um, I know when Tony and I came up here, that was one of our biggest concerns was having people in the hallways as kids transition. Um, 
is that a question to ask that, you? That's or is more that... for staffing for Brockton High to, uh, you know, for floor teachers and for hall monitors and everything. I mean, we still want to be a presence there, but we really are there just to ensure that everything is going. If they need our assistance, we're readily available, but that's really for school disciplinary and conduct for them. Okay. So when you refer to traffic, are you talking about like traffic? Uh, yes, traffic. Outside? Okay. All right. Thank you. Or vehicle traffic, yes. Um, before Mr. Rodriguez asks his questions, can we just touch base on Enforce 911? Where are we with that? So I think we are, I would have to tap in my notes. I'm, I have to apologize because I was talking to Tobias Collins about that and I want to put a ballpark figure of 50 percent and that might sound you have to forgive me for that one okay. but i know uh lieutenant banaka did the overview so we can get the floor plans and for all the school and there was some sort of late entry and that's why it's just holding up holding us up but i'm not sure who i heard it from but i, I think it was a delay on the actual company um because we were supposed to have it effective as of September. Yeah. Dr. Krebs, do you have any updates on Enforce 911? So I, I would uh, say that Sergeant Livingston's estimate about 50% or so is, is pretty accurate. We're, we've completed the, the first couple of phases of uploading all the data for the schools, like I said, the floor plan, the school layouts, um, the school staffing, administrative staff, and, and the people that we have to upload into the system for each location that will get notifications from, you know, Again, the teachers can opt in because it can bring up their, their, um, their cell phones or their PCs. Um, the PCs will be automatic, but the cell phones are their personal ones. So we've pretty much gotten through that stage of uploading all the school data, and then we also, they have to upload the data from the police department and the contacts and who's going to be notified for any, any incidents. So we have pretty much got that, that part just about done. So we're moving to the next phase, which will be, um, kind of testing and, and, and you know, alert, you know, notifying the system to activate it. So we're probably 50%, but it, it's a lot of back-end IT technical kind of stuff at this point that goes, goes the next step is. Do we, do we have like a projected date? No, but you know, I, I would say we're, we're, we're it, it would be probably at least before the first of the year around that time, but more than likely sooner than that. But it, you know, it, again, it's just, it's difficult because people change, and, and I'm sure you're aware of our email system that we use, and we have to purge the system again to make sure all the people that have left or, or retired are not right. notified in the system, so that, that takes some time. So until we, get, um, until we get this up and running, I, I mean, I would feel yeah, more comfortable. We're, I'm we're not sure about the We're doing the same other. way that we've done it always. I'm, I'm calling and notifying everyone. I, I just want to make sure that all the schools have enough radios. I know some schools um, were waiting on the Enforce 911, but if we can maybe just check with the schools and make sure. I mean, yeah, that they, could be a temporary fix. We, we honor radio requests as they come in, but, you know, we're, you know, oftentimes radio requests come in for a radio for every teacher in every classroom, and we just cannot do that. We can't afford it. These radios are eight hundred plus dollars each, you know. Uh, okay. So, but they have enough adequate for the staff and for locations in the building, and 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 a lot of times the request comes in because there's a problem with the PA system or a perceived problem, and like for instance at East right now, we that system went down, and we have to, we're replacing some major parts to it, but we'll I just expedited that process. It'll be up and running sooner than later. So. That's the first thing to address to make sure the PA systems work. And if they're saying we need radios because it doesn't work, it sometimes it's a, it's a it's a problem with the equipment that the, with the staff. It's a user you know problem, if you okay. will. That happened at Pluff, for example, and we they're saying that nothing works. We can't call any classrooms. And as it turns out, somebody figured out how to pick up the phone in the room and turn the switch off so it doesn't call the office. So we had to go and look at every room and fix it. So they do work, but okay. so we, we do have adi adequate radios. If we need them, we'll get extra radios, but they're not expensive. But as you know, we're watching the budget very closely right now. But okay. if, if we, we have some on hand and we'll make sure we have a stock on hand as needed. I mean, I know the budget, we're watching it, but safety's my top priority. Mm -hmm. I gotta just make sure that our teachers and our staff have the capability of being able to reach the office in case of an, 
case yep. of an emergency, because sometimes the cell phones do not work mm -hmm. in the schools. They're not getting good reception. But um, Mr. Rodriguez, I apologize if, if you wanted to. Thank you. Um, on the hiring process, um, and, you know, we have 13 and bringing four, 17 total. When it comes to, I know, you know, with the background and the physical agility test, um, I know you have that six month period. Wouldn't it be suitable to do the PT test prior to the background? Because, you know, you, you invest in time and it takes a long time to do a background. And you do this background and then you have these candidates that you select that can't pass the PT because it happens. So that, that point has been brought up. However, to counter that, if let's say we pass the PAT test, perfect, then we, that test, the clock now starts, right? So then, let's say we do the background check, then we do the psyche valve, and then we finally can reach out to a police academy. But if that, because we started with the PAT test, the clock started there, now we're outside of the window. But I, I know, you know, we voted to have this exam, but I mean, like, we're not under the guidance of civil service, you know, when it comes to, to that standard, but I mean, you know, that, that's the police academies. The, the, the academy, but I yeah. think, you know, if there's something that we can do prior that doesn't, you know, tie into that, meaning like, you know, prior to you taking this exam, you have to pass the, these basics, um, these basic standards. Okay. Um, I mean, something to look at. Um, Absolutely. Because, you know, I know it's a, it's a time constraint. But I, um, I had, you know, our last uh, subcommittee, I asked, like, do we have, have we made like an analysis of, how many officers we would actually need um, to have a sustainable uh, police force? Um, like actually, you know, school police officers. Do we? Is it twenty, twenty-five to make sure that you know? I, I would say, considering people taking time off, maybe sickness and what have you, uh, I would say twenty. 20. I know that. I know where we're at with finance. We can make it work with whatever we have. These guys are that dedicated. But obviously, optimum, 20 offices. 20. That's dealing with traffic, uh, implementing a swing shift, you know, so we, that eliminate that overtime to coverage at the foot, foot traffic, 20. Yeah, because, you know, looking at it, I know right now we don't have, you know, weekend coverage. Um, and then all the assets that we do have, I know, you guys have the ability during the summertime, you know, to tweak the hours um, on that note. That's why I'm, you know, trying to think, you know, what's a suitable number to make sure that we do. Because, you know, this, you know, the high school is used around the clock on weekends. And this. there's a lot of events going on at the middle schools and um, out field. So I was just trying to see How if there can. was like an actual analysis of what the actual number would be to make sure that, you know, it was staffed properly. Absolutely. So that's where I... Uh, I'd sat back with uh, Lieutenant Maker, deliberated back and forth, and that number we, right around the 20 number, 20. would really be the optimal then, number. And as far as um, equipment, is there like a, a, a need for, I know we've received a grant. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's not, I, I reached out to Michelle. We're still waiting for that, if we've been awarded that. Uh, grant. Oh, so we haven't even been awarded the. Oh, no. Okay. So I, I, I was under I, the impression that's what that I was under the understanding too. But then I reached out to Michelle Bolton, and she said, "No, nope, right around the end of April. Uh, I'm sorry, of October, we should know for sure if we have it." And that's why yeah. I addressed. It's usually it's around this time of year, usually October, November time frame, where you usually get notification. It's been pretty consistent that we we get awarded what we requested through the COPS grant. And, as Dr. Livingston said, we were able to upgrade the radio system already the, across the district, including new antennas, base radios, uh, cruiser police officers, uh, cruiser radios, handheld radios. Uh, so we, you know, it's pretty pretty consistent every year we get the award. As far as a, a need for the department, you know, equipment, vehicle, I mean, we everything's in line. I mean. We, is there anything that needs to be updated? Do we have enough vehicles to cover the new staffing that we're going to be putting we, on board? I mean, fine with, with, uh, we can always use more vehicles because uh, they, uh, maintenance and so on. 
But uh, I think we do, I think a couple of our tasers, I know one taser we're borrowing from Brockton PD for one of our newest hirees. But again, we're waiting. We put in that uh, request, and that's why I, I opted to request it to let, a, let this officer borrow this until we get uh, the funding, and then we can get the tasers on our own. So I don't want us to spend something where we're going to hopefully, and being consistent, get rewarded and come out of one fund where we can get it granted to us. All so. Right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question on the grant. Do we have a do we have um, a dollar amount? An idea of a dollar amount that this grant is? I believe it was a seven hundred. The cops. So the grant. cops grant. Yeah, seven hundred thousand. Yes, it's been a while. Almost probably about that seven hundred thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank and you. That what you that usually would the award is around five hundred or so. That's what we that last time I think it was the last cycle was like a little over right, five hundred thousand. Because it divvies up, right? That's so that's why I was that's why I almost lowballed us and said five hundred. So that's I thought we were gonna get. on that grant that we would purchase, you know, the tasers yeah, and absolutely. anything else. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's where it's it's geared for. So, um, what, one last question. So. Are we doing like school tours with our police officers to get them familiar with our schools? A lot of the new ones, so, um, do they just go? Which is and actually, it's not a bad idea because we our students are seeing the officers, getting familiar with them, getting more comfortable with them, so, but letting them get in there and tour to so get familiar. That, that that is how we have done that. Through, either through our field training officers, we see various uh, all the schools, but also we have a rotation through all our middle schools uh, to be their designated uh, monthly to be a, no, I'm sorry, weekly to be a designated SRO. So they get familiar with all different schools Then they'll have uh, some assigned to the high school, some assigned to our middle schools, and then our uh, west side and east side dual type uh, mobile units will also visit all our elementary schools. It's a pretty good scheme, uh, system that we have working. So the last question I have is, um, I know I touched base with you on this. I'd like to see, and I'm sure we have this, do we have an actual go-to manual at every single school in case of an emergency? They go to this manual, because you might not have electricity, you might not have internet service, but it's like your manual, where to go, where our students are going, and we have copies of these all so that, at one that, location. That is the emergency safety okay. plan, yeah. It's Perfect pretty comprehensive it has all that in there yes. and they know in case of an emergency you go to this book and this is where our students this is the closest parking area this is this is where the buses are going to meet if we have to go on foot um, because a lot of times you might not have internet you might not have electricity or be able to call out but that way we know where our schools where each individual school has their own specialized I, I believe Tobias worked on something yeah, similar yeah that's okay I remember talking to Tobias Okay, yeah. perfect. So um, that I like. Mr. Rodriguez, did you have another question? What's the number for the uh, SROs right now we, that we, only we have, have on? So we're actually, and I appreciate that about the school department providing so many officers, we're actually assuming those roles as SROs, but we have been afforded one SRO from the chief from the Brockton municipal side, and that's and she's she's unbelievable that's officer uh, nicole anderson yeah. but i i wasn't i know with the grant there's a certain amount of number that needs to be within the that needs to be within the schools so just having one i don't think we're even meeting that criteria and that's something that we need to uh okay. look into because we could we could lose that grant okay i definitely will as of tomorrow okay mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Mrs. Rivas Mendez? Sorry, um, I know the metal detectors you said are working well, they're lightweight. Um, is everybody get, going through the metal detectors or just students as of now? So that has been addressed because it was brought to my attention that uh, some parents were coming through to pick up kids. We've addressed that, that everyone now goes through the metal detectors. Okay. No, this on oversight. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sergeant Livingston. Right. Thank you. So thank you again. Um, next, we have Dr. Murray to address um, our transportation department. So you're going to go over some opening of school update um, 
regarding the busing and any issues that we've run into and your presentation. Okay, good evening. So I'll give you an update uh, first about our transportation inventory, if you will. We currently have 62 large buses, 61 of them are operational. The uh, 62nd bus has been in a repair shop and was supposed to be finished the end of September, we're hoping the end of October. Uh, typically, uh, industry standard is that you hold 10 buses in reserve, which would be six, 10%. Uh, we hold three. We have 65 micro buses or vans, we call them vans, um, 65 of which are all operational. And we hold uh, three of those in as spares. We currently have uh, eight wheelchair vans, seven of which are operational. The eighth is a used vehicle that we purchased that we're just waiting to get plates and stickers, DOT and state inspection. Uh, we have five 7D vehicles, um, of all of which are operational. Currently, we have 138 bus and van drivers. We have four uh, additional drivers that are in uh, various stages of completing their training, which consists of classroom and uh, driving <clears throat> uh, for a total of 60 hours. We've actually had a couple of people that have licenses that drive for other companies that have applied, and so we actually do check rides, background checks, drug tests, those kinds of things. Um, we currently have three 7D drivers, but we just onboarded a fourth uh, today, and we have another person that we're just finishing um, some of the paperwork on, and again, they have to do the drug test, and we'll have a full complement of 7D drivers for our 7D vans. So that's kind of our, our inventory in terms of vehicles. Our staffing, we currently have uh, two dispatchers, a safety and training officer, a, a dispatch supervisor, uh, administrative assistant, and a um, transportation director who also does the special ed billing along with the McKinney Vento billing. And then we have one technician and Jay Hopkins who supervises the fixed operations, and then myself. So that's our staffing. Um, we are facing some challenges. Uh, the system is, is stressed in terms of student numbers. That's obviously no one's fault. Um, we started the year, for example, with uh, 1,370 door-to-door students. Those are our special education students that ride the vans. Uh, in the last six weeks, we've added 88 students to those vans, which requires that the uh, van routes and van schedules change a little bit. Our parents have been super cooperative with us as I couldn't uh, be more appreciative of our elementary schools who really bear the burden of these changes in that third tier. Um, that does not include the additions of McKinney Vento students or uh, out of district placement students. Uh, we received just over the weekend five McKinney Vento additions. So the numbers continue to grow uh, transportation wise students. We try to create a balance with our vans uh, obviously, we don't want uh, smaller children uh, on the, the vehicles for uh, over an hour. Uh, we're getting to that point. There, some of them are, are crowded. Uh, at the end of September, we have the students, or the drivers rather, do a, um, we call it a rider report. Essentially, they, they map how they do their route, the pickup times, and also what the numbers are in their buses. We already know that we have a couple of buses that are really full. Once we get all that data, uh, which we've collected last week and the beginning of this week, then we'll make changes to some of our big bus stops to try to shift some of those numbers so the buses aren't as crowded. But again, uh, folks have been really cooperative with us in terms of uh, you know bringing things to our attention and then uh, you know allowing us to address them. Uh, anytime we get a complaint from a staff member or a citizen, principal, teacher, it's investigated. Uh, typically. Uh, the minor stuff or stuff that's more of a kind of an operational thing we'll address ourselves, but we also have uh, a disciplinary process with the uh, dispatch supervisor, the safety and training officer, and then we refer uh, any of our more significant transgressions directly to HR where they will deal with them uh, along with the union uh, folks uh, for discipline. Um, but that's really it. Uh, the biggest thing is, again, uh, we have about 240 students who we do not provide transportation for, but who are transported by vendors. That is a direct uh, result of the uh, pre-K students that we have, the large numbers of pre-K students who are the most neediest and the youngest 
and as a result, we felt it was important for those students to be on our vans with the radios, the, tr the training, the familiarity with the schools. And uh, we did have a meeting in July uh, with all of our vendors. Every vendor has to provide uh, evidence of insurance, valid insurance, you know, valid uh, operation certificates. Any of their drivers had to be cored and fingerprinted. All of those are at uh, HR. And then uh, they go through uh, this big meeting, but they go through a pretty intensive uh, doc indoctrination process, if you will, with Jen Briggs and Jen Perez in terms of expectations for the treatment of our students, uh, timeliness, those kinds of things, uh, communication with us if there are changes or issues uh, with, with their vehicles, just like we would with our own drivers. Um, they're all given plaques and uh, laminated placards to, to put in their vehicles so that there are instances where we aren't able to reach all of our parents in as timely a fashion as we like if we have a large number of our drivers call in. Um, but at least we, we know that the parents know that if this vehicle shows up that they're, uh, they've been checked out and that we, we feel as confident as we could be. I would obviously prefer that everybody be in one of our own vehicles that we control, but we just simply don't have the vehicles now. And that I don't think is anyone's fault. Uh, the numbers have just increased dramatically over the last couple of years. And uh, again, with the advent of the pre-K testing and then the resulting uh, law that requires them uh, by three years old if they do test to have needs to be transported uh, has really stressed our system and the folks have been great about it but it is it is a very demanding uh, situation so. I think um, all in all things have gone off pretty well um, some changes down in the yard to try to ensure that our vehicles are, are leaving uh, to pick the students up in uh, complete 100% functioning order and that would be all of the lights all that kind of stuff we have two technicians in the yard at 530 um, about quarter quarter of six actually and then uh, the vehicles don't start until six o'clock but they all have to go through uh, one way and um, you know we have some of the minor stuff bulbs those kinds of things in the yard it can affect repairs right there uh, today we had a couple of flat tires long weekend they go low so they'll go right up to the shop and one of the two guys will go up there swap tires so that they're not late and uh, you know they get where they're supposed to be thank you um, so you had gone over some of the numbers with me dr. Murray Correct. so if you could just go over the numbers of the door-to-door -door, how they've increased because they increased I mean drastic I mean it was a huge um, so I, I think there's a little bit of a misnomer uh, for, for, for a number of years, uh, close to a decade. Um, Peggy Kalia, marvelous work downtown, and did a lot of the rooting with First Student. Uh, she did that in kind of conjunction with the special ed department, which was Jen Perez, who now kind of works with us. And um, even uh, Peggy and Jen both could not get over the a tremendous increase in the last couple of years of the door-to-door -door students. Um, in just this short period of time, we've added 88 students, you know, so it's over 1,400. Uh, that is a lot of young people. And the vans um, are micro bus. You might see on the side, it'll say, you know, seats 25 students. You clearly cannot put 25 students who have a lot of challenges who are younger uh, on a bus and just you know drive for hours so there are limits to the the number of students that you can put into these vehicles and uh, again it's it's challenging um, I can't give you specifics I know that in terms of dollar amounts I kind of I showed you I think I gave dr. Cobbs that kind of a brief summary you can see some really dramatic changes in our uh, McKinney Vento uh, dollars that we spend that typically run out of title one and then a tremendous increase in our out of district expenses for those students that have really unique uh, education needs. And those um, two expense areas, if you will, were always part of budgets not related to the non net uh, school bus transportation budget, which is typically kind of what people think of when they think of transportation is the school bus. Um, um, before I open the floor to questions, um, where are we with the Find My Bus app? Or oh, good. That's, I knew you were going to ask me that. I, of course I am. I've been asking. <laughs> so um, 
We've actually, we tried to do a little beta testing this summer uh, to no avail. We didn't really get any takers. And then something that uh, we discovered on our own in conjunction with Where's the Bus is that the computer Versatrans and Where's the Bus, it calculates, for lack of a better term, the route that uh, it thinks the bus should take. But obviously it's not from Brockton. And so there are some streets with cars parked on both sides. Like there's parts of Moraine that you don't want to take a big bus through. You know, the curves and the cars on both sides. And so, again, as part of that, a rider review, we ask the drivers to give us their route so that when they're out sick or they're doing some training or something, whoever covers for them kind of follows the same path, gets there at the same time. So what we've had to do is we have to go into Versatrans now and program the route. We've been doing that since last week. We're hoping to have that finished by the end of this week. Uh, Jess Hodges is going to recruit 100 folks from v various uh, tiers to kind of beta test this for a couple weeks because we do have issues like with any electronic device. Occasionally the GPS will fail. Occasionally it will act kind of crazy and we'll have a bus going 100 miles an hour in the Atlantic Ocean and obviously we know that's not happening. So we're getting close. I think uh, we get the data input it into that Versatrans system at the end of the week, get those 100 folks um, on board to actually have them test the app, the app itself. She has all of the information with regards to, you know, how you sign up. And then um, I think we'll be good to go. Uh, our hope would be to have things uh, rolling, you know, sometime, certainly before Thanksgiving. So um, my last question is, there's a lot of road work going on in the city. So I know I'm, going circles sometimes trying right, to get to right. where I need to go with all the detours. How are we doing as far as communication with the city? Because I know in the past um, we weren't getting updated. Um, well, Dr. Cobbs has been great about that. Anytime okay. he's made aware of construction, he's, he's let us know. Uh, Ken Thompson, uh, the facilities has let us know. Uh, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of times with, they're not made aware of it either or there are it, it, situations where it's not necessarily something that's planned but suddenly becomes an issue. Uh, for instance, over by the Brockton Hospital, they had some water seepage and all of a sudden they had to tear the road up for a couple of days to, to fix something. Uh, that's not one of those things where they had the, the luxury of you know letting us know. It does impact um, the timeliness of some of our drop-offs, especially in the na afternoon, especially for our third tier students, the elementary kids. Again, the parents have been fantastic. The schools, the administrators, so cooperative. We work with uh, Jess Hodge, Hodges and uh, Kelsey Lynch and basically what I do in the afternoons is I work with the bus dispatcher and as soon as we recognize that a bus looks like it's outside of that 10 15 minute window for some reason we'll let her know and then they can actually text the parents and say you know bus 34 from the Baker is running 15 to 20 minutes late the north uh, east section of town like uh, North Quincy and Main Street the last couple of weeks they've been doing some work up there and it's, you know, it's really challenging. We can watch the, the little icons of the bus on the map and it will sit there. You know, we'll, we'll look at the live picture to see what's going on. And they're just stuck in traffic. But the people have been really understanding and the kids have been really good too, so. Do we have a direct contact in, in that department that notifies us or is it a department that notifies us? I, you know, I, I think uh, Dr. Cobbs might be able to speak better, better to that. A couple of times, on, I can't think of the gentleman's name, I apologize right now, but. Um, uh, Pat Hill is the director Hill? of DPW. Yeah, yeah, a couple of times, I've, we've actually had a concern and we've expressed it to him like we'll say, uh, like a tree, a wire is down or a you know, branch is down. And he's reached out a couple of times. So I think for the bigger projects, they've been really uh, you know, pretty cooperative. And, and as I said, Dr. Cobbs and Ken have been pretty helpful there too. So. Uh, no, definitely. It's just, um, I just know I was driving in circles trying to figure out how I'm going to get to where I need to go when that whole area was right. detoured. Now, so, and I can't imagine how our buses are doing that. And again, keep in mind that the bus has to unload on the right. So it's even more of a challenge sometimes. I will say that the uh, Brockton police uh, who have been involved in some of the bigger road work projects have been really helpful in terms of letting the buses through, making sure the kids are safe, the bus is safe, understanding that, you know, we, we need to get the littlest kids as close to home as we can. So they've been very helpful. Uh, same with school police when we've had an issue. Um, but it is a challenge and, and it has created delays. It's really, you know, Friday traffic for some reason, everyone's 
out on Friday afternoon is kind of crazy. So. Thank you. Um, any questions from any of the members or any statements? Uh, Mrs. Rivas Mendez and Mr. Rodriguez. Um, so I have a question in regards to safety, the crosswalks when students um, get off the bus, there's not like a crosswalk person, like a crossing guard. Mm -hmm. Is that your department or is that more the... So uh, occasionally we'll have even drivers say to us that they have a, a situation where they don't feel that the street is safe for the kids to cross. Yeah. We'll reach out to Ken uh, Thompson. He'll reach out to school police. Uh, a good example of that is if you come out of the high school and you take a right onto Forest, one of the first streets you come upon is Gordon. And there's always a large number of high school students that are, you know, just getting out of school and kind of, you know, rambunctious. Um, we had an issue with some drivers concerned about the kids really not paying attention, so we asked for some help. And, you know, they, they stationed somebody over there. I think, um, I know Dr. Cobbs as a director of operations and then as the deputy superintendent, they go and kind of analyze all of the crosswalks over the whole city. And so when anything's brought to my attention or anybody in our office, the first thing we'll do is have our safety and training officer actually go out and kind of check it out. Even uh, occasionally somebody will call it with a concern about a bus stop, that it's just, you know, it would be smarter if it's around the corner or if it's a little further up the street. So we'll send uh, Ms. Spano out right away just to check that out. And then if it's a stop, we, we can change, but if it's crossing guards or you know, some other situation where, for instance, traffic doesn't seem to pay attention to the red lights on the buses or something like that. We'll notify uh, Sergeant Livingston and, and he'll bump it up to the city folks or whomever. So. so if there's a community person that has concerns, who would they reach out to about well, this? I, think, I mean, they could reach out to a transportation that would probably come to, to myself or they might refer it to Ms. Spano. And then if we go and check it out and it seems like it's a legitimate thing, we'd obviously check with the drivers the other thing is that all of our buses are equipped with cameras. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do uh, last year was actually secure two additional cameras, a camera in the very front of the vehicle, a camera in the rear that, that focuses to the front and to the rear so we can actually see what oncoming traffic looks like, uh, not just inside the bus. So if, you know, if somebody has a concern, we can find out which vehicle goes there. We can kind of check it all out and then Obviously, if it's a situation where they feel it's warranted, then we'd let uh, Ken or uh, Dr. Cobbs know, and then they'd kind of go from there. Okay. And then I know you, I know Joyce asked about the Find My Bus application, um, the app. When did you say sometime? Sometime so, next? So we're hoping that we'd have that before Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, it's really the tedious part, which I'm going to admit I, we didn't really re recognize as, a, as being an issue until we actually started to use it with some of our drivers. And the driver was going one way, and the app was telling him it's like the thing in your car, your phone. You know, oh, you missed the turn, but you can't go down that street. It's a one way. And mm. so uh, this just just going to require that, you know, we have, a, a, what, 130-some-odd vehicles out there. We're going to have to re, reprogram their routes into the computer. But we, we made some good headway. We started on that about 10 days ago. Okay. And then I just have two more questions. In regards to the the increase on the door-to-door -door students, mm -hmm. you said there's been an increase of 88 students. Um, usually those students are because they require transportation through their individual education Correct. plan? Okay. Correct. Correct. And then um, out of... Out of um, out of placement district. So is that us transporting those so, students uh, or is that typically, private? Typically, uh, long before we had our own transportation department, any out of district uh, placed students, were, those are typically students that have really high needs that, mm -hmm. that we don't meet here in the district. Uh, those have always been transported by uh, vendors, not, not by first student, not, not, but paid for by the Brockton Public Schools the, uh, as part of the special education budget. The McKinney-Vento uh, students, again, were also always transported outside of that uh, non-net budget, but that's um, Title I. I, I you, know, you could call it one of those underfunded mandates. I don't know that they get 100% reimbursement for that, but they are supposed to reimburse us for those costs. There is a uh, kind of a complicated uh, process. We've actually met with the attorneys to make sure that in 
some cases with uh, students in, under Title I that we're doing cost share with other districts, making sure that we're not, you know, absorbing the 100% of the burden from an extensive expense standpoint. But there are certain obligations that we have uh, legally that we just have to. But that, that again, that is kind of a separate item, if you will, from our buses in terms of the, uh, you know, buses and vans. Um, so going back to the micro buses where you said there's only 25 students that fit in a micro bus, but there's 88 increase. So how, how is that so, with what we have in inventory? So typically that again, when we say 88, it's not all in one tier, thank heavens, but it is probably predominantly in that third tier. And so the, the standard, what are the tier ones and tier three? Sorry, uh, I don't know tier one is the high schools. Okay. Uh, tier two would be the middle schools, and then our uh, high schools that we service that aren't necessarily Brockton Public Schools, Spelman, Trinity, New Heights, uh, those those types of places. And then the third tier is the elementary schools. Okay. And you know, basically, again, there is a lot of shuffling that goes on. We're trying. The, the micro buses are a little bigger than the old vans, the old yellow, you know, first student vans that you might have seen. I mean, they can seat uh, 25 students. We can take uh, the golf team or like the girls volleyball team, teams that aren't huge, you know, those, those teams can fit on those vehicles. But it's just really a, a matter of, uh, I think, what's right and what's practical with these youngest students and how many you can actually put on one of these micro buses. And, you know, we've got a couple now that are a seven, which means, you know, they go all over the city depending on what program they're in um, with the traffic and just, uh, you know, the nature of where they're going. It can be, you know, a 45 minute an hour ride. So when we have more students added, then the dispatch supervisor works with Jen Perez and they try to look at, you know, okay, here we're adding these couple of students what makes sense? Can we change this bus van's route a little bit and move this student onto this van? And um, it doesn't create a lot of continuity, unfortunately, for kids who really grab onto that. But again, we're just trying to do you know what is best for the largest group of uh, of students, and uh, it's challenging. Um, like I said, it's it's uh, stressing. Uh, the, the vehicles and the system we currently have. And I don't think anybody could have predicted. Um, I was, you know, recently just made aware of the whole dynamics of the pre-K testing and, and the results of that. So I think things have changed from before they, even when they just started to talk about the purchasing of vehicles, I think there's been a lot of changes number-wise. And I'm not sure that, you know, anybody was really cognizant of that, so. And then when we're, when we serve special education students that are door to door, there's a para that's required to be part of this commute? So there are some uh, students who have on their ed plan, their IEP, uh, a monitor. And we are legally and technically not supposed to transport that student without the monitor. Mm -hmm. There are other students who have IEPs for transportation who in fact do not require a monitor. And um, if, if you have a student who is supposed to get a monitor, that person can't serve like double duty. They're not supposed to be watching me, but then also kind of keeping an eye on the, uh, the bus. So in the past, it's been kind of a carte blanche. I think uh, Dr. Cobbs has um, kind of reined that in a little bit and uh, schools can still request and get monitors, but there's a little more of a process than just throwing somebody you know, on the van to, uh, to go for a ride. And it needs to be a little more of an explanation. And I think so far, I, I can't say I've heard of anybody that's really been uh, complained about not getting a monitor when it's become a safety issue. I know the superintendent's office has you know, been right there. Uh, typically, uh, we have uh, monitors on the large buses those first 10 days of school at the elementary level, third tier, because of the little, little ones and we just want to make sure that they get off at the right stop and that there's parents there. And then as the drivers in the big buses, those routes don't tend to change very often, get a little more familiar with those students. Um, they get used to the routine of the bus. Um, then, then we kind of phase them out. But if a principal calls and asks, 
you know, we've got a lot of problems with behavior on, on a bus. We've had to pull the bus over. We've had vandalism, that kind of thing. Then uh, they'll reach out to the superintendent's office and he can approve, you know, a monitor for uh, maybe a week or 10 days. A couple schools will get a monitor and have them hop from bus to bus so the students don't know when there's going to be a monitor on the bus. And that's, that's been a kind of a nice uh, little behavior thing for them. And, you know, at the end of the day, they're all, especially the little ones, they're all excited, they're going home. You know, we try to get them home as fast as we can, as safe as we can. But uh, sometimes a monitor is, is necessary, you know, just to help out in the beginning. Um, not really uh, monitors for the high school, you know, the big buses, we don't do that. We have the cameras, we have any issues, we pull the video, we send it to the high school, and they, they address it. Yeah, I just wonder if there's any way that we can try and get more monitors because the bus driver can't really take care of any behaviors. Oh, that's correct. And, and there have been instances where uh, folks, uh, parents have been disappointed because stuff has taken place in the bus. The driver hasn't, hasn't seen it. They're really kind of focused on the road. Um, the monitors are, are wickedly expensive, but if you have 137 vehicles with a monitor in each one in, in the morning and in the afternoon, or just in the morning, it, it adds up. So I think uh, they've been pretty, uh, Dr. Cobbs has been pretty clear that if they submit a proposal, uh, again, I, I don't recall anybody being denied because then typically they'll either CC me or ask me and I'll say we well, have to, you know, get it approved from the superintendent, but then once you do that, you know, we'll set it up, so. Okay, and legally you can't, the door-to-door -door students can't be 25. They can't fill that. Oh, no, no, no. So I, how many I'm students are I'm just using that example. Is, uh, those yeah. vehicles are much larger, so somebody might see only six or seven students in it. It's simply because it takes a long time. Yeah. And uh, it's just not right or fair. Uh, we would, I would never dream of, of doing that. So and usually it's like six to seven students yeah, in and those 25? I think, 25? you know, um, we, we tried to start it off at five, knowing full well that we were going to have the numbers increase. But again, the parents have really been great, as have the schools, because we have done a lot of changes uh, to those vans uh, simply because of the numbers and then trying to, trying to be accommodating and you know, trying to make sure everybody gets to school you know, kind of in a timely, fair fashion. So. All right, thank you. Yep. Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you. <clears throat> Just to piggyback on the door to door, knowing that we had that increase, is it, is it fair to say that we need to increase our fleet to, to, to make sure that you know, we're providing the... So I think I'll answer that. Service. Yes, <laughs> we absolutely do. We could use more buses and more drivers emphatically, yes. So do we have a number of how many more buses or vans do we actually need? Because 88, <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge bump. So Dr. Cobbs has already asked us to kind of look into that, and um, I use that example of the 240 students that we currently aren't transporting. Those, by the way, are in lieu of the pre-K students, again, because they're needy or smaller. Uh, and if you put, uh, you can do the math fairly quickly, they're not all in the third tier. They're not all into elementary students. So I think that's one of those things where you, you could uh, start saving money uh, by buying additional vehicles. I, I think you could look at 20 uh, vans very easily, and that would mitigate a tremendous amount of the money that you're currently spending uh, with vendors. So, uh, so, Dr. Murray, when you say vans, again, we use our, our oh, culture here as a minibus as a van, but many, many our, our vendors are actually drive like 12 passenger vans, they're, they're actual vans. So right. are you talking about the smaller vans? Like no, the so, drive? yeah, I apologize. Mm -hmm. the, the 7D vans are like the Honda Odyssey. Right, the, exactly. You know, that vans that we use kind of slang, I guess, really, is mm -hmm. really a microbus. Mm -hmm. And I think that microbus has... Um, multiple utilities in terms of during the day you can you can put um, we've used a couple of the vans as uh, vehicles that sweep so that when we have a group of students at a bus stop for example in the morning we have uh, a bus uh, for the Raymond that is very full and there may be 10 or 12 maybe 15 students now when the weather's gotten colder we'll send the one of our micro buses which can accommodate those numbers readily um, they're not the large buses. I think you could also look at a, you know, a third option, which would be one of those 
12 passenger kind of van type vehicles, uh, I, I think you, you get better, uh, you have better options if you kind of stick with these micro buses. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, some of that would be driven by budget constraints. You know, what is the significance price wise between a 12 passenger van? The 7D vans are kind of like the vans you, you would get at home. Uh, it, it can accommodate five people. You know, you have the captain's chairs and the three in the back. But a lot of those vehicles uh, that are 7D also transport students again with some specific issues, uh, ed plans and so forth. And so you, if you have to put a car seat in it, that limits the space. Uh, one of the things that we weren't aware of when uh, the vehicles were purchased is these micro buses can be ordered so that every seat actually has a car seat built in. And we actually have had to buy car seats because of the numbers, because of the vans that were originally <coughs> purchased. They just weren't aware of that. That's not, again, something that was in the forefront of people's minds and the numbers just didn't exist. So I think you could do uh, some smarter purchasing that would be uh, allow you to, to put a few more students in those vehicles uh, because of the way they're, they're constructed. And again, they, they can be used in a number of roles. So I know we have the, the white minivans, so. Right, those are the 7D vans. Those are the that, seven. So how many of those do we have again? We have five of those. Five and. Uh, yeah, we have three uh, currently operation. We just kind of finished uh, onboarding one driver who will start her orientation tomorrow. And then we have another person that's just got to go through some of the final paperwork, the drug testing, that kind of thing. We're hoping that will be next week. And then all five of those vehicles, sorry, will be on the road. Um, and those drivers are not uh, technically in the Teamsters, and so it is a different rate in terms of uh, what they're, how they're compensated. Um, so it's a little bit of a savings. And really the, the original thought with those was to try to absorb uh, some of the really expensive out-of-district placements that uh, – in some cases can uh, you know be four or five hundred dollars a day uh, there are some special cases so that was kind of the goal of the 570 vans that we currently have um, and then you know in a perfect world that's why we bought the used uh, eighth wheelchair van because wheelchair students are very expensive to transport um, this is, it's a little bigger uh, than our micro buses, but not a full size bus, but it does have room for a wheelchair. So that's our spare, which allows us now to use our seventh uh, wheelchair vehicle that we had ordered, that they had ordered originally, to operate in all three tiers. So that, that was a big, big savings for us. So what would the ideal number be for the uh, 70? Again, I, you know, or it's too early to tell, or I, I mean, it hasn't been. So we have, I, I believe, we have nine. Uh, oh wait, I'm thinking a wheelchair. It would really depending on how uh, many of these out of district placements you really wanted to try to absorb internally. I, I couldn't give you a specific <coughs> figure on that right now, but in terms of dollar amounts. Um, I could get that for you, you know, in a couple of days. I'd be happy to send it, send it to you. I got some other information with Dr. Cobb's permission. He, he, I'll send it to him and he can send out, you know. But I, I think it would be fair to say that you could easily double the number of those 7D vans. And, you know, every time you take um, one of these very expensive uh, transportation uh, situations and bring it back internally, uh, we're, we're paying... Twenty dollars an hour for those drivers. So, I mean, if you if you pay them six hours as their guarantee, you do the math, and instead of four or five hundred bucks, you spend one hundred twenty. And the vehicles are new, so they're, you know, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, we we had we have to equip them. Uh, that's one of the things I have in my forecast was that it costs us about four thousand dollars to equip one of those. That's all the lights. Uh, the backup signals, you know, the s sounds, those kinds of things. We uh, have, we don't have radios in them because the radios don't go as far as the vehicles go, but we do have a phone, you know, phone just dedicated to that, to that vehicle. 
um, you know, the signage and stuff like that. So along with the cost of the vehicle, it's about $4,000. Stickers, just 35 bucks and... Um, so they they have the the same camera system outside you know? we we actually they don't have the camera system that the buses have but we have put our own lipstick camera in so that we have a camera inside the vehicle so that in, in the event there was any kind of question questionable behavior or situations like that we, we have we have that it's on a i think it's a the last 30 days and then uh it, you know goes away Okay. Um, another question. Uh, when it comes to two part, I know we eliminated the private uh, security. So now we have, is it two or three security staff? So we have, How's that? We have one person uh, who works 20 hours a week. It's random, uh, random hours. And it's usually like nine to one or ten to two. Uh, we're actually utilizing an older, uh, former uh, police car as a kind of a presence down there. Uh, we have some cameras that are installed and some solar lights, and so uh, we made it very clear our expectation is for this person to drive around in the lot, come up towards the. Uh, a shop area as well and just kind of um, make sure that we don't have people in that in the lot we've been very fortunate uh, when they tore the grandstand down we ran into some issues for the summer with people who had been dislocated if you will for lack of a better term and we ran into some real issues with that and so I, we reached out about trying to have somebody there uh, just as a deterrent um, when they tore the grandstand down, the uh, owner of the property asked us to uh, close that one gate on Forest Avenue that was kind of directly across from the, from the grandstand, which really kind of forced us to change the way we um, set up our parking lots and the bus lot. Uh, the result being that it isn't a cut through anymore, so it's really cut down that traffic in the evening. Cars can't come through the lot and go out that gate they can't come through the bus lot and come up by the, the offices. So that, that's been kind of a side benefit to that. But we have uh, been able to kind of stop any of the nonsense with people getting into the buses and, you know, getting out of the rain, that kind of stuff. Um, so we were able to really kind of reduce that expense significantly. And at the same time, as I said, it's random. Uh, I, I know at the beginning of the week when they're going to be there. The first home football game, we changed things around a little bit so the person was there a little later. Uh, Halloween, there'll be somebody there on Halloween, everybody listen to you know. So uh, just I mean, so that, um, you know, as a deterrent. And I, I think we really have been very fortunate uh, in terms of vandalism. We haven't really had any vandalism. Uh, we did early on purchase some catalytic converters because we were concerned with how open the lot was so we actually have some cattle converters in stock because we were we were being told it was uh, 40 to 60 days um, before you could get those so we have you know stuff like done stuff like that just to try to make sure if something does happen but we've really been very fortunate uh, and especially with the change in the lot and then having these somebody down there it's, it's been good I know but um, to say I mean random <laughs> i mean that doesn't sit well with me um well i say random because i we we aren't doing the full thing i mean off camera i'd be happy to give you details about the schedule okay i mean not that because i know i i've seen people I, are listening no, I, I, I know i know but i'm just saying you know, that i know there was you know you know the cost of you know having security for it when it was up here and having the police and then it went to private and then right. it was just like, where's the real cost savings? And, you know, I actually said, you know, we might as well just hire our own staff to do that. It would well, be a lot cheaper when you have to a certain our own extent, security. That's, that's what we have is somebody who, um, ex-police officer who's kind of our own thing. But like I said, I'd be happy to. Okay. I mean, not that it's, <laughs> it's I'm not guarding that. Oh, no, I know. I mean, we have to protect our assets. No, um, I agree. And I think, as I said, I think um, 
our big concern was pe people, f the, unfortunately, you know, people less fortunate than myself um, were actually forcibly getting into the vehicles and uh, weren't really doing anything malicious, but were doing things in there which you and I would not approve of and which meant we had to sweep the entire vehicle to make sure there wasn't any needle, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we've stopped that, and I think that is because of this presence, and it really, um, I think it's worked well. Like I said, I go in a little bit of detail. Um, another thing, I, I mean, how are we um, enforcing our um, collective bargaining agreement with the union? For, I know we, ha we purchased, um, was it the sweater shirts, shirts. Yeah. i mean is so that, that being enforced that's, that's part of uh i think you have other unions in the district as well i know the custodians that's part of their agreement uh we were really fortunate um our administrative assistant jen briggs actually got the same price that we got last year and um you know part of their evaluation which started kind of at the end of last year but now we went over in our drivers meeting is that they have their uniform on which consists of the sweatshirt or t-shirt, uh, their ID, and then a safety vest. And they all understand that that is part of the evaluation process. And so when I'm down there in the yard in the mornings, at, you know, six o'clock, we were reminding people about their vests, about their IDs. If a citizen wants to know who they are, they are employees of the city of Brockton. They are to show their ID, they are to be respectful and let us deal with whatever comes. But yeah, so um, we still have, I guess you could call them some gray areas. The, uh, the, the union, the two union stewards have been pretty cooperative. Um, so has the Teamsters, HR has been helpful. So, you know, we try to avoid grievances and that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's the nature of the beast in, in some respects. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we deal them, you know, one at a time. Uh, but I think the labor agreement, uh, it's the first time for everybody. And so going forward, the, the next contract, you know, the, the drivers will ask us some things which they're, you know, probably not a terrible thing for the district. And I think the district will have some things which will help management and just smooth the operation and not uh, reduce the income potential for the drivers, but also stabilize some of the, some of the expenses for the district as well. So when it comes to the cleanliness of these buses, Whose uh, responsibility part, part is that? Part of the evaluation that? is that the driver is to maintain the cleanliness of the vehicle. Now, that does not mean that they're expected to sanitize and wash the windows every day, but there are, you know, trash is supposed to be uh, tossed out. They, they all get trash. I have trash bags in my safety vests. I hand them out every day. Uh, but they all have brooms. They understand what that is. Uh, when we have other drivers use other buses for trips, I actually have a clipboard. I will go in on that Monday and I will check the buses to ensure that they've been picked up. Uh, they're supposed to be returned with no less than a half a tank of fuel so that somebody doesn't come in to grab their bus Monday morning or Tuesday morning as it were today. You don't have a quarter of a tank and have the thing be a mess. So they're responsible for that. Um, anytime the technician, Rob, Jay, or I, or anybody gets in a bus and they have a cleanliness issue, it's immediately uh, brought up to the driver's attention. Okay. And they're pretty, you know, they're pretty good about somebody takes a bus and it's not clean and they keep it clean, they will let you know, very rightly so. Now, for a point of information for the public, now our bus drivers, our bus fleet are not just servicing just Brockton Public Schools. Right. Everybody that drives for us is an employee of the Brockton Public Schools. They... Um, they work for us. I don't know what they do on their free time. It's possible that they could drive, you know, on Saturdays for uh, a vendor or somebody like that. No, what I'm talking about, like, it's uh, our services to the city, um, you know, the private schools. The Oh, yeah. Everybody that drives for us is a Brockton Public Schools employee. No, like, meaning our transportation department providing services to... Right, well, we're legally bound to provide transportation to Carl Spellman, Trinity... New Heights, uh, we, uh, Norfolk Aggie, yeah. No, I understand. Do we have, what's the reimbursement on on those services to these privates? I know there is none, but so the public can know that. 
I don't believe there is a reimbursement. There isn't reimbursement. There isn't. The that's it's part of our non net spending. It, it, it's yeah. not reimbursed by the school. We, we, they're, if they're Brockton residents, we're responsible for, for transporting them to school. And that's why we have one bus that goes to Norfolk Aggie up in Walpole. There's about 27 students on it. And again, that's a regional school that we can't provide you know, those educational services here. So we, we don't get any reimbursement for that. Okay. That's it for now. Thank you. Well, r real quick, real <laughs> quick. Um, I, I, I know I voiced this um, previous um, subcommittees, and I, I did, you know, go to the lot, and you know, last school year. Um, I know it's noon that we're going to have hiccups, so we're going to have issues with our transportation. But I honestly think that we need to have a, a top to bottom. Um, audit of our transportation department to make sure that we are staffed adequately and making sure that the department is uh, is run proper and that when where we can save we can save um, so we don't run into any more issues so I, I don't I, know if I, we want to take that up now and move that forward uh, so we can get it um, approved at the next school committee meeting I think that's a great idea I think what you had in all candor was three different expense areas. Your non-net, the city took care of. Your out of district and your McKinney Vento, and then through. And again, I I I never saw a financial statement in two years. Um, no. Nope. I all of a sudden they were all lumped together, and when you look and you have a transportation budget of thirteen million dollars, and people are like, oh my god, you know that's like a million dollars a bus, <laughs> but it's really three different budgets. Um, anytime anybody has taken a vehicle, uh, anytime an athletic team has gone, we have always done a trip ticket because when it was with first student, uh, they, you paid for getting the kids to school. Anything after that was extra. And that's why the athletic department had a transportation budget. That's why middle school sports had a transportation. I think it would be in everybody's best interest to examine all that and to find out how that's being accounted for. And then there are things, like I said, the McKenney Vento is a term that I, you know, have heard for years is an underfunded mandate from the state. So, you know, you can, you can calculate from there. And another thing, how is it, what's the process, let's say, for example, um, somebody wants to rent one of our buses for a field trip that's not oh. associated with the school. So what's so the process of them well, doing that? <laughs> we, we, typically just, what would happen is they would reach out, reach out to us. Uh, a club from Brockton High or uh, we have some outside entities that um, new folks downtown and, and wanted us. I mean, one of them has like seven buses that go, go to a, a thing on the weekends. And what, what happens is, is they will re typically reach out to me and then I'll have the dispatch supervisor who also does all the booking. We have them fill out with a trip request, and we will give them a quote. And it's a formula that we use. It's, it's the same for everyone. Uh, we don't discount for anybody. Um, it's pretty cut and dried. Uh, we do an in-city rate for our schools, like school, you know, Brockton to Brockton. But after that, it's, it's um, a rate that's based on a formula, you know, how far away how long, how long they're going to be gone, that kind of a thing. And then uh, we'll send them the, the quote, the proposal, and they can look at it. In some cases, when it was groups here, you know, they would ask for a discount or some kind of support, and I always referred them to uh, the superintendent's office. We're not, I don't do discounts. Um, that's just not my, my thing. And so... Uh, that's where those would go, and if they worked it out and they told us that it was okay, we would go ahead and, and do that. Typically, when people go on a trip, they will have a check or a purchase order uh, for the driver, and then when the drivers uh, return, they have to hand their sheets in, they have to know how they were paid. We would uh, then make a copy of that check, send the check and the trip ticket uh, into the finance office, and then they would apply it to whatever account they used so we had discussed this before the meeting um, dr. Murray 
our whole purpose when we got the busing was to be able to rent these out and to be able to pay for some of our expenses. So right. um, unless it's in-house and it's something for our students, right. I think moving forward, we really... Well, and again, it, we, and I don't mean to sound flip or anything. It, it was not my place to decide who would get a discount and who would not. Uh, obviously, uh, the schools, like when uh, they go to the Fuller Art Museum, that, that's a discounted mm -hmm. thing. It's our kids doing something. Uh, the parade, uh, the holiday parade. You know, there's an expense associated with that. I mean, I don't think we have to worry so much about the mileage. Yeah. No, for our care. students, it's different you for in-house. So yeah. that, that kind of stuff, I, again, that would be something where I would uh, reach out to the superintendent and say, hey, listen, you know, we're going to need four buses for the band, the JROTC. They're just going to go from the high school down to the War Memorial. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, we're, ha we're happy to do it. We want to do it. This, this past right. year, we did the cancer walk. I didn't actually ask anybody. I just, we, you know, the past, we'd always provided transportation for the people to walk for the cancer thing. Uh, Brockton Hospital had a, uh, s they called it a soft opening. They weren't really finished, but they wanted people to come in and see, you know, how things were going. And I think that was, I want to say, in August, the beginning of August. And so we provided transportation for Brockton Hospital. So there are, you know, some charitable things, obviously, that we're not going to do, take care of our own, our own students. But at the same time, there was a cost associated with, you know, sending a football team to Andover, or the soccer team to Lexington. And, and there's, there was, at least, you know, years ago when I looked at it, there was money set aside in these different departments, you know, to cover those expenses. And obviously, they don't go full retail because there are so more of it's like you know our outside renters like let's say for example the council on aging wants to take a trip to right so Fox what, what they would do is they they would call and we would give them a quote and then you know they would say well is there anything you can do about that then i would say you know i'm going to suggest you go speak to somebody in the superintendent's office uh and then they're welcome to to discount it however however they wanted but i i was not uh we didn't do that we, we did ourselves say, oh, we'll just do that for free or we'll just do that for this. I mean, I did in a couple occasions. I think I might have done it. Oh, because when it, when it comes to, you know, um, facilities. Like facilities, like rentals, I mean, this body right here is the one that approves what the, what the, what the price is. I've never seen right. it. To well, we use, a, we use a formula. And again, I, I don't I know. I know the, there's a formula that, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming just off the top of my head, you're responsible for the driver. This is, yes. you know, the miles. Uh, we figure out there's a, a rate for the mileage, uh, like maintenance on a vehicle, the fuel rate. I, I, I think uh, it, we, we had started off last year at 375. We were, you know, had a little, like, 25-cent cushion on gas. <laughs> well, fortunately, it started to go down. But about, you know, two weeks ago, we were right at, like, 370. So the formula changes a little bit depending on, you know, cost of fuel, that kind of thing. So you would have the date of how many outside groups have actually rented? Is there well, something that's documented Well, every time a vehicle's there? used, goes on a trip, uh, that thing is, there's a report generated. I have a folder in my desk. Uh, I think it was like the last, I want to say last quarter of last year, and I probably have about $160,000 worth of statements. So maybe, so moving, maybe moving forward, we should work on like a rental, like we do with facilities and have just... Look well, at we a don't, basic yeah, rental. So, again, I think that, that would be welcomed. I think Dr. Cobbs would welcome that, too, is we don't really have uh, – we've been very judicious about uh, any kind of uh, rentals that really aren't somehow related to either the city or um, the schools. Uh, we have. We've done – you know, we did a couple of weddings, but there's some real strict guidelines, no food, no alcohol, you know, that kind of a yeah. thing. Um, I'm and, just, cause I'm just, you know, um, curious to see like what that rent, you know, how many rentals we did, and you know what the transportation department brought in, right, and where that money went. Well, I can, I can show you. Uh, like I said, I'll, I can give you a figure based off of the slips, how that was uh, reflected in the financial statement. I, I have no idea because again, I never saw. You know, it's just it's more of like okay, we just brought in X amount of dollars, but we put it right back into transportation. Or we just took 
Well, and, I, and I think, and you know, in some cases, you're create. So, again, I use the example of the football team. I just know uh, Friday, two football team, two buses for the football team. I think it was four for the band and the cheerleaders in halftime. So we're obviously, we create the trip ticket. We, we create that a bill, if you will. And then we would submit that. And my assumption would have been whatever was determined was the amount was then taken from the account that provided for transportation for the athletic department, the music department, whatever. That money was transferred, one would assume, into transportation. Uh, but again, I never, I, I can't tell you how that was managed. Uh, okay. But I could get you that information then because no, we're I know, pr I know pretty cautious about like the checks when we've, you know, so uh, let's say the uh, George, third grade wants to go on a field trip to the aquarium we give them a price they say okay their pack or whatever their fundraising arm raises that money then they would give us a check when they come back from their trip we would submit that paperwork with the check we keep a photocopy of the check for ourselves and um, submit that down to the financial office so i can get that for you it's going to take me a little time probably yeah, for another thank hour. you thank you definitely i mean i know it's it's, you know, transportation is new for the district, and we, we know we're going to have hiccups. Yeah. So well, we just want to make sure that. And again, it's really what you want to do going forward in terms of how aggressive you want to be. Uh, I, I would be inclined uh, to limit your, your outside stuff simply because of the wear and tear on your vehicles. But we don't, you know, we never so, really, there was no real policy ever established. Yeah, so I know we didn't, there was no policy. So I guess, you know, we do have to establish yeah. a policy of who we're going to rent it to and. Um, what the well, criteria what is, is. It isn't acceptable, and then that would just use that, and we'll go from there. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we're running over time for our next subcommittee, so I just had just a couple of comments. One is lighting on the lot yep. where the busing is. Um, if you need more lighting. I think we're good. We're uh, good. We have four big lights. Uh, something uh, folks probably don't realize is that um, Mr. Carney is – renting out the infield of the track to uh, some kind of a power company. So they've been doing a lot of work on that infield. Uh, he's put some electrical stuff in there. It would not shock me if there are more lights uh, okay. erected and they have security as well. But we have four pretty powerful lights. We also have the two uh, lights with cameras um, th that we, we've got. Uh, with the way the lot is now configured, um, I think we're, we're okay. The street provides some lighting. They did create a, another parking area for us that they're going to pave tomorrow. So we might have to move one of the lights a okay. little further back or over. But I, I, I think right now we're, we're pretty good. Okay. And um, when we were talking about the vans, the 7D, mm -hmm. so I know I've, I've heard from a few people that actually put some of the students into the vans, and they just said it's easier when you have the vans that open on either side, Correct. getting the students in and out. So if we can just keep that in mind when we're looking. Those, those are the, re the first uh, reason we bought those vehicles was because of the one-way streets. And the law says that the student can't cross the vehicle to get in. And so by having a sliding door on both sides, the vehicle is able, because it's one way, to pull over to the left, slide the door open. The one thing that uh, wasn't uh, discussed is they don't have uh, the captain's chairs in the middle row. They had a bench seat, which means they kind of have to crawl over each other. So, again, those are some of the things that uh, weren't discussed and, and people, I think, in their zeal to do stuff maybe didn't think of. So, uh, you know, going forward, should we have the ability to order vehicles? I think that's more of a conversation for, for everyone, kind of what, what is your goal? What are you looking to accomplish? Uh, our motivation with the, the first five seventies was to simply try to absorb some of those really expensive uh, out of district trips, and I think we're doing that. So, okay. So, do we need a? Okay, Mr. Rodriguez. I was going to ask if we needed a motion, motion to move this to the acting superintendent to bring um, before the committee of a whole to do I a make motion audit? to um, approve the acting superintendent, Dr. Cobbs, to move forward on conducting an audit of the transportation department. Second. And now, for clarification, does he need to bring that to the committee of a whole, or is, can this committee request it from you, Dr. Cobbs? Uh, committee of the whole. So the motion is to request the acting superintendent, Dr. Cobbs, to bring um, a, mo uh, a request to do an, inter an audit of the transportation department 
before the full committee in that was your motion? motion yes, was, that's the motion. Okay, and it was properly seconded. So motion's been made by Mr. Rodriguez and properly seconded by Mrs. Rivas Mendez. All in favor, show of hands. That's three unanimous. I think what has to happen is you have to report out your subcommittee to the full committee, and then yep. at that point in time, you take a vote to have me we'll conduct We'll do that the on audit. the 17th. Yeah. Yep, we'll do that. If we can add that to the agenda on the 17th for that potential mm -hmm. vote. Okay. Okay. And then um, I believe that was it. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, for the present. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, but, but before Dr. Murray finishes, I just want to add that uh, I want to thank Dr. Murray uh, personally because I've known him for a few years. We worked together here at the high school, and Dr. Murray is retiring in uh, February on the 24th, I believe it is. 17th. 17th. Yeah. Count, who's counting? <laughs> um, who's counting? After 24 years of service to Brockton Public Schools, so I really thank you for your service and stepping up at this point in time to help get the transportation department you know, online and, and running smoothly. So well, thank you very much, and Appreciate I wish you all the best in your retirement. Cause you probably won't see him again before this committee before he retires. So. Yep. Oh, we're going to have to Thank make sure you, we have Murray. another meeting before you retire, Dr. Murray. Well, that, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do that for February yeah, 16th. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. All right. Any questions? And again, please feel free. I know Mr. Rodriguez has come by, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Co Dr. Cox, but come by and see. It's, it's, uh, it's something to behold. It really is. So. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Um, next item, other business. Do we have any other business other than bringing this motion before the full committee on the 17th? Nope. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? So motion's been made by uh, Mrs. Rivas Mendez, properly seconded by Mr. Rodriguez, and the motion carries um, full. Good evening, everybody. Meeting adjourned. and welcome to the Facility Usage and Planning Subcommittee meeting at the George M. Rahm Little Theater. Today is Tuesday, October 10th. The time is 7.45. And we will begin, uh, sorry, in addition to attending the public can view this meeting via television on Comcast Channel 8 and 1071 HD version and online via the link www.youtube.com slash the Brockton channels. And we'll begin by calling the meeting to order. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Ms. Asak? Here. And I'm here, Jared Homer. Um, our fourth member, uh, Kathleen Ehlers, is not in attendance tonight. Uh, she was not able to join us. Uh, we've established a quorum. Uh, the first item on our agenda was an executive session. Uh, we will have to postpone that. Um, we do not have um, the members present to conduct our discussion. Um, and similarly with item number two was a discussion of an easement for West Elm Street for the Keith Field Access Boys and Girls Club and we need to make sure we have an opportunity to um, get updates from the Boys and Girls Club as well. So we will postpone those items one and two to a later meeting of the Facilities Usage and Planning Subcommittee. Uh, item three on the agenda is an update on the Huntington School renovation work. And uh, Dr. Cobbs, would you be able to provide us with an update on where we stand with renovations to the Huntington? Certainly. Um, good evening. Um, so at this point, we, we have not actually started any renovation work yet on the Huntington School because we purposely waited until the school year started and to get into October once everything kind of gets running more or less smoothly, which gave us a lot of time to complete the summer projects and then complete a, a, a number of uh, open work orders at the schools. So I have a meeting set up next week to meet with our architect and uh, Ken Thompson, my facilities director, to go through the building and, and with some ideas of what to do for the, you know, for the sort of the remodel. Um, one obviously is that there's a major remodel needed for the gymnasium. But the question becomes, and I, I need to have this discussion, we, we kind of discussed it somewhat with the cabinet members. Um, and a, a, a little bit I've discussed it with the mayor, but we need to decide as a body here what is going to be the usage for the Huntington School. 
Um, my suggestion is you know, we we use the Huntington School and open it up as a preschool, which we've been trying to do for years and try to figure out what make that happen. I think it will lend itself well to for younger students to uh, the building. Because of the building design, it has so many nooks and crannies. It was a, very much a problem for the older students and for the, the special needs population, older students there. But it lends itself well to a preschool because those students are always walk to class with it, you know, in a line with their teachers, if you will. So they're always monitored. And, um, the building has, you know, by my count, not using the basement, um, at least 20 classrooms available to use for pre-K students. And, and working with my cabinet to get some numbers on how many pre-K classrooms right now we've actually pushed into some of the elementary schools. It's about 19 classrooms. So you know we could use that building and, and do, again, half session, you know, morning and afternoon sessions and accommodate probably 500 or so students in that building, 535 I think were the estimate that I saw, you know, based on, again, two sessions and morning and afternoon sessions, which obviously increases the revenues, you know, for us for those, those students. And, and, um, and again, we, we it, it may not impact the district so much as far as teachers, because we can, I can imagine, we can bring some of those teachers out of the elementary schools now and, and, and push, put them over into the, the uh, new preschool. That, of course, would, would re require us to, and which I recommend, is to keep the therapeutic day school where it is at the, at the Westgate Drive building. It's a great building for them. It's a perfect size for that small school population. It's easy to monitor where the students are. When I did a walk through there with the principal and assistant principal, um, Megan Botham and, and uh, Terry Finnegan, I walked in the classroom. The students were in the classroom. They were engaged. Ms. Otero was doing a great job with the science with the students. Um, they were in the classroom. They were engaged. Um, it, 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 it was a school, <laughs> and, and I think that's a great location for them. And you know, my recommendation, what I'll, I'll flesh out further for this uh, body, is to take a look at the purchase of the building, and, and as we started to do almost two years ago now. Uh, so, the Huntington School, yeah, we want to start the, the renovations, and 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 um, we we need to do some general cleaning, fixing up anyway, new carpets, wall painting, ceiling tiles, new light fixtures. Um, but beyond that, you know, we need to figure out what we're going to use the school for because that would require us to take a look at the, the bathrooms and, and how we can add, make additional bathrooms and certainly for the bathrooms that are already in place, you know, again, renovate them, fix them up, put in the lower toilets for the students, um, which is not a problem. It would require, you know, some amount of plumbing to do, to put, you know, instead of every classroom, you know, put a, in a cluster area, you know, a classroom for the students where it's, it's like in the middle of the classroom so the teachers could monitor the students in, in the bathroom. So we have not started any reno renovations yet. Uh, we're going to walk through and take a look, you know, bring again proposal to this body to take a look at what we what we could do, what we need to do, and and a, and a cost associated with that in that time frame, which of course we know the time frame is you know, next September first, basically. Ms. Asak, please. Thank you, Dr. Cobbs. Um, so I know we've we've discussed this in the past on this committee, and I I thought we were under the impression that I was under the impression that we were going to look at the um, is it the Shaw School as far as going to the old Shaw School on, in Ward 5, and we were gonna get the metal building, which would have been less expensive than putting, because wasn't it millions and millions of dollars to renovate the Huntington? And I've been through a few building renovations, and I just feel like we went through the renovation with the Barrett Russell to accommodate the younger students you need the, the, sh the smaller sinks, the smaller mm -hmm, mm -hmm, toilets, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, it would make more sense to keep them the same size they need to be and maybe get step ups. That or, could be an option. Because sure. that way, if we don't, you know, things change down the road, we can still use it for the older students or still use it for adults. Um, but I would. I would like to see what the numbers are because originally when we heard about the Huntington, it was millions and millions of dollars and, and it, it was a, you know, a number that was really out there and I'm thinking the metal building 
would have gone up faster, uh, more energy efficient. And I think at the time we talked about doing two floors and, um, and it was just gonna be a lot less having the metal building and you would have the outside space. Mm -hmm. As far as the Westgate Mall area, I mean, I don't know offhand, I believe it's 35K a month. That just doesn't have the outside space and I just don't think that that's, I wasn't for it mm -hmm. when, we, when we voted on it. Mm -hmm. I just don't see our younger students no, I, I would I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the younger students pre-K at the Westgate building. No, it would stay as a therapeutic building as it is right now with the therapeutic student, which is a mix of students. And yeah, um, and yeah we could look into other things to, for that building to accommodate. We could easily add on a space metal building similar to the one we have over at Summer Street, you know, a small gymnasium and, and accommodate those students um, quite, e quite readily, I think. Um, yeah, the option to demolish, you know, the Shaw building and, and to, you know, correct, erect a new, you know, steel metal, metal building would be an option, but that would, that's probably two years in the planning and, and, and construction to do that at least, and obviously appropriation of funds, which, you know, it's going to run into a few million dollars as well, you know, um, to erect a building like that, whereas we already have the Huntington building. And I think we could certainly look at a less extensive remodel in, 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 in building out the school to accommodate the new students. With, with, I think, you know, I hate to put a number on it, but it, it wouldn't be millions and millions of dollars. But everything's, everything we do, especially with the supply chain issues and, and, and construction costs where we have to pay prevailing wage rates, um, you know, it, it's probably, you know, four or five million anyway to, to do, to re renovate the building. But... We have a solid building, you know, it, it has a cafeteria, it has a gymnasium, it, it has the, you know, the classrooms, it, it has an elevator, so we own it already, we just put a new roof on it for $1.7 million, you know, so it makes sense to renovate it and use it for something that's going to be in the community for a while. So, I know with the new roof and other repairs that we've done um, with the MSBA, mm -hmm. we can't keep it empty. How right. long it's a school, do they give you? To get big other school. Um, um, because they, we had gotten some of the funds. So we, how long do they give you to have that filled with, whether it's administration, administrative staff, or students? I know um, we, we can't leave it empty because of the renovations. I think that was one of the... Um, yeah, I don't think there's so much a restriction or, or a... a window if you will of how long it's empty for us to do the remodel as it is we we're not going to sell it or, or close it down because we just put a brand new roof on it and i think the timeline is our own and and like i don't know of any kind of rules that say we, we put a new roof on it you, you got a year or two years but i thought there regardless was. you know the, the plan is to have it open next september so okay um because i know originally when we we heard about the remodel um for the huntington mm -hmm. they were talking about and I don't remember, but I want to say twenty something thousand, uh, twenty something million or more, right, right. or forty something. It was, it was well, again, really it was, up that there. Was, that was a kind of that was a Cadillac, the total. You know, yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, for yeah. that kind of money, you can buy a building for a lot less yeah, exactly. instead of putting that kind of money into a building. But again, we own this building already, so we're not buying a building. I think, you know, and you know, I'm looking at working with again the finance team and um, looking at some of the ESSA funds that were allocated and. We're still trying to figure out if they're still available. We had funds that you had voted on for the you know, the uh, school, you know, modular units for the, with classrooms, mm -hmm. and we decided not to do that. That was around five million dollars, you know, a little over five, five point six somewhere around. There. The it was seventeen million total for the for the modular Modulus, trailers because it was. I, well, I, I just saw a spreadsheet I was looking at with the with the um, open architects people, I, and, and there was a question. But I saw at least like five or six million dollars that would, that could be possibly reallocated if it hasn't been already reallocated and amended for something else. And we're still looking into that 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 number. But um, you know, I could probably make it work for that. You know, we you could we'll do all the all the renovations in house and and cause, and the other part of that that price tag that you had talked about, Joyce, was that we were looking at contracting out, the, again, the, the state-of-the-art gymnasium and, and re taking down the stage and rebuilding and doing that. We won't do that in, in this, this time. We'll, it's really the, the floors, the walls, new ceilings, new lighting fixtures, and 
And again, we can do a lot of that work ourselves in house, you know, and, and even the demolition if it, it, these days is a heavy price tag, which we'll, we'll do ourselves. So, um, it's a lot of work in, in a short amount of time, and that's why we waited until you know late later in October to start because again we got a lot of work orders out of the way, so we can have most of our, our facility staff working on it. Yeah, I do know there's a need for our pre-K. I, I did get a lot of calls it's, and it's emails from need, families yeah. um, because of the pre-K. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we've, we've talked about it since I first came on the committee, mm -hmm. growing the pre-K, the Burr Babies, right. um, you know, with the pre-K program, because there is such a need and to get them into our schools at an early age and then get them, you know, into the Brockton public school system. Mm -hmm. It just makes it easier for them to transition um, into kindergarten and then, you know, first grade. But, uh, you know, if the numbers are much lower, I yeah, mean, it would will, make we sense. We will put together that, a that performer a for you school. to take a look at. Uh, I think that school holds over 500. Yes, yeah, it, it, it can certainly accommodate a full, you know, again, standalone pre-K. So we'll have two pre-K buildings, you know, the, the Bat Russell and, and the Huntington building, hopefully. Um, the other thing to consider, Joyce, is, is the... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to take on additional pre-K students, but right now we, we've pushed those students in the classrooms into elementary schools that aren't equipped to be pre-K schools. You know, no, they're spread and, out. And, I know. And changing, changing diapers, and, and, and again, the, the, the toilets aren't set up for them, and the teaching staff is not, and the, and the, and the administrative staff is not necessarily equipped to handle pre-K students. So, again, we create the standalone school with the proper staff that's trained, and, and, and I think it's, it's going to be a win for this for the district and, and the source of revenue for the district. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, are we, are we, <laughs> do we have enough staff to make sure that we get this renovation done? Um, I mean, it's a fairly large building. Um, is it something that we're going to have to hire some contractors to come in to, to give a hand or... Are we going to tap into Southeastern and, and use some of those students to we're, come we're over gonna, and work? We're going to tackle it ourselves. You know, again, we have, you know, I, like I've been saying since I was the executive director of operations, I would match our, our facility staff, you know, our, our craftsmen against any, any crew, any construction crew anywhere. And they're, they're top notch and, and they're, they're efficient and they know what they're doing. So it's, you know, it's for us the expenses will be, more of the expenses will be the cost of the materials and, and, uh, and, and rental equipment for, to use with that will to demolition for the gym. But, you know, they're great. They, they, they're good. They do a great job. They're professional. And um, I, I believe we can get it done in time with a reasonable price tag. Mm. Oh. Guess we got to tackle that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the biggest expense the again will be materials. You know, the lighting for the gymnasium. You know, the the flooring for the gymnasium. You know, we we may at some point look at you know once we get the floor because we have to rip up the existing floor to get it down to grade and put a new subfloor in, contracting out the actual oak floor. You know, to get that done. But we would finish it ourselves and like we do all the gymnasiums every summer, pretty much. Okay. And. Um I, I just think that, I mean, the area for the therapeutic day is we should, you know, look at other options of mm -hmm. getting them away from that environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they obviously, you know, they need their own space. Um, that's, you know, my, you know, I didn't vote for it. Um, I think they, I mean, it's, it's doable for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they actually need their own space, school, gym, cafeteria, the whole nine, that mm -hmm. they they actually experience an actual school setting. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you, uh, Tony, but I, I don't think that the Huntington is the right space for them either. The Huntington building is the right space for them. Yeah, so. yeah and I'm not I mean, suggesting that they go to the Huntington. I mean, like, we have to look at the long-term plan. Right. I, I agree. Getting them out of that, you know, mm -hmm. getting them out of that space and making sure they have their own um, their own building. And that's definitely something we would have to do before the start of the next school year, too. So we could probably add that to right. a discussion. We can bring that, bring that up. Okay. And um, Mr. Rodriguez, anything else? Oh, okay. Ms. Hasek? So how many classes do we have at the Barrett-Russell? 
Um, you know, I have to, I'd have to check on information, but I want to say that I think we have like 15 classrooms at the Barrett Russell School. Wouldn't it make more sense to put them all in one school? And maybe There's no use, room for them. <laughs> well, at the Huntington, and then maybe use the Barrett Russell for the therapeutic day? Hmm. I don't think we, we would have enough a room at the Huntington. Mm-hmm. Because we, we already have the pre-K spread out throughout the city. Right. And, then and, you have and, Barrett, and the Barrett Russell is full. <laughs> Barrett Russell is full, and I don't think the Huntington will mm-hmm. accommodate. Right. Yeah. Not enough time to get that. I don't think because you're talking at the Barrett Russell, 15 classrooms with about 20, 25 students. I think there's a little bit more than 15 classrooms yeah, at the Barrett it, Russell. It could be. I, I don't, I, I mean, off I've, the top I've of my head, I'm not times. exactly sure, but I, you know, it's... You know, you're, you're talking 300, three, you know, three to 400 students at the Bat Russell already, and then another three to 400, uh, 500 at the New Huntington building. So okay. they, they wouldn't all fit into one building. Yeah, I just don't. And your classroom sizes would start to really get un, un, unwieldy at some point. So what we currently pay for the Westgate Drive is for the second floor. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we pay for the for both floors actually. We're, Whole building. Do we have we, we have full use of the first floor as well now? Except for, except for where the the uh, church is. So. That's what I thought. I knew there was still. Um, so right now, annually at the Westgate, it's about two hundred thousand, two two hundred three thousand dollars a year. Two hundred and three. So I calculated four hundred and twenty. Well, that doesn't that doesn't include the non net. I mean, the uh, triple net. The triple net. That's so. That's so where I came up with was, the four twenty with the, the taxes lease, and yeah, everything. You could, the actual lease is two hundred and three itself. Two, uh, uh, okay, mm-hmm. but it's really four hundred and twenty. Right. With it all could, it could quite the be taxes with the, and everything, because we have non, to pay taxes. With the triple net, the you know, utilities and because we don't own it, so that's why we have to. Right. Um, okay, I I personally would like to see the numbers for. The renovation of the Huntington, what, mm-hmm. what the numbers would be, and I'd also like to see. I know it's like two years out, but I'd like to see the numbers for an energy efficient metal building uh, that we can design. It's just going to be state of the art because I know we had discussed where the where the Shaw School is, and they, there's a good size um, grass area, green space, things like that for our for our students. Mm-hmm. So if we can just see the numbers for both. Sure, we, we can work up those uh, cost estimates. And again, you know, it's not, it's not just the, the cost, also, also it's a, the time factor. Dr. Cubs, I know you mentioned um, just the cost of materials for this year for renovations, the, the lighting, the flooring, painting the walls, um, mm-hmm. possibly step-ups for bathrooms and things and accommodations at the Huntington site. Um, do we have money in our budget to um, to cover those costs in, these, in this school year, um, things that would have to be completed before September of uh, Yes, we should. Again, most of the, the labor costs will be covered because we, we're going to pay the craftsmen you know, all year anyway. Um, you know, we could, we could, again, I could get a cost estimate. You know, like I said, the most expensive things will be the gymnasium lighting fixtures and, 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 the, and the flooring. Um, the walls are pretty straightforward. It's sheetrock right. and, and there's nothing special there. Um, trying to think of the, you know, lighting fixtures for the classrooms. Because again, we'll go in and put ceilings and in, in new, new suspended ceilings and new light fixtures in, in the classroom. So the, the, the major expenses, like I said, will, will be, you know, the, the gymnasium lighting okay. and, and those things we could price out. And, and probably once we kind of get a goal to get started on it, order them now. So we'll, 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 we'll be installing them probably in the spring, but we can, we can start doing the work, order them now. So. Okay. And then were there any, would there be any other... Um, any other requirements for that age population in the Huntington uh, in terms of bathroom accommodations, things like that? Is there any like set or specified limit or, or requirements of how like a minimum number of bathroom spaces available? That, that I could find out when we walk through with the architects. Okay. They, you know, Angelo, he does a pretty good job of you know, you know, doing the, his estimates based on what the requirements are for okay. the state and, and the federal requirements. Okay. Um, other things that we'll, you know, take a look at is, is you know, the walls, you know, especially the lower walls, and maybe coat them for the students, you know, and, and, and some of the doors that need to be maybe changed out. Too. Yeah. 
And I think one of the only other things we had talked about previously this year was just um, little legs and preschool kids going up and downstairs to get mm-hmm. to the second floor and things like that. So maybe like railings and obviously just right. adjusting height for things yeah, like that for the, kids. The and the railings and, and obviously there's the elevator again for yeah. any any special needs. Yeah. Handicap needs. But beyond that, the building, I mean, it's ADA. It meets all ADA yes, requirements absolutely. and things like yeah. that. So it's, It meets it's, the requirements. It's a school. I mean, almost it's, it's ready to go. It's been a school. It's been an elementary school forever. Sure. You know, and yeah. It, okay. That's great. Um, any other members? Anybody have any questions on item three? Yes, Ms. Asa. Uh, it's okay. Just to, um, when it comes to, it's probably less expensive to try to adjust our students to the toilets and the sinks mm-hmm. rather than to have to replace and bring in. Because mm-hmm. at home, they're using regular sized toilets True. and sinks. Yes, that's a good point. Um, it might be, or in, in, you know, we can find. So I think if we can adjust things to our, for our students, might be less expensive as well than rather having to redo plumbing to, you know, smaller sinks. You're going to have to reroute things. Right. We might just be able to save a little bit on the expenses You're if right. we can it's adjust e- them. You did give it a facelift and replace the fixtures as they are as needed. Then, then and just do the, the step ups. You, you see right. the two steps. They step up. There's right. a sink. At home, they use regular size sinks. And in, in, we can probably throw in some smaller ones mm-hmm. to help some of the teachers and staff um, if some students are having a tough time. But mm-hmm. I think that would... That would just help with the expenses. Definitely, definitely save costs, you know. Because try to try to save costs. Very specialized fly. plumbing fixtures instead of buying standard, you know. Just buy the standard because that way mm-hmm. it'll always be there, mm-hmm. you know. And if we have right. to just, you have the step ups. And I've seen them, I've gone to the Barrett Russell and they're adorable. They're the small sinks, the small toilets. But that only accommodates the younger students. Where if the Huntington, we can adjust it so our students are able to use them. Mm-hmm. We can yes. save, maybe apply the money that we save somewhere else um, with more updating, but, I, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, we, the way the Huntington is configured, I'm not sure if you, you walk through there, I know Tony walked through there, just tend to walk through the, every classroom in between the classrooms there's a small sink area that, you know, we, we looked at maybe, we had, at one point the price that you had was to convert all of them into smaller bathrooms. Um, like I said, we can probably do that to one classroom in a cluster area, so they can they can use that for the students to go to the bathroom, but and then take those areas that and convert those into like changing spaces for for, for the young uh, students. So, you know, I, I think again the, the space lends itself well to to make it in a preschool with with not very expensive uh, renovations. So. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions on item three? Okay. Moving on, item number four is an update on the rental space and the storage space for surplus goods. I think we um, we had started a conversation about this at one of our last meetings, um, and I just thought maybe we could talk a little bit about um, what would we need to do, what would need to happen for um, the process of getting an inventory complete of what we have, and then second to that, um, putting those items, surplus items out for bid so that we can begin to clear out space that uh, think things that we're storing that we're paying to store uh, right now. Yeah, we're paying a lot of money to store things that we're not going to use. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the question: Have you been there, Jared, to see the the actual all the books? And again, Joyce has, and, and Tony has. There's, there's, I didn't realize we put all that stuff over there, but we had to move it out of the other schools like the libraries to do renovations and create classrooms out of the libraries at, at East and at West. Um, so there are a lot of books and a lot of things there that we'll never use and we have to figure out, again, if you want a detailed inventory or uh, are we just going to, what the process will be to donate them. Um, so that's the question. Do you have a question? Say a sec, please. Thank you. Um, I actually spoke with you recently regarding this. Um, so as far as the Perkins warehouse, I mean, the, the space, there's a lot of space, but I just don't agree with having to pay to lease a, a building with stuff we're going we're gonna to be um, donating. Mm-hmm. So I know in the past we've talked about different organizations, um, you know, opening it up. You know, is it something that to take an inventory? We just don't have the time. They don't, and I can't see facilities. But I mean, if we just go there or, or designate a member to go there with with a facilities member and just maybe we can take an inventory. Take this is what this is what we're deemed. This is going to be donated. Um, 
and then maybe have them get a container, fill the container there, and then take the container to, you know, whichever country they're shipping it to. Because for our facilities department to pack up the stuff and then take it and deliver it, first of all, we don't have the manpower. Mm -hmm. We're taking them away from our from BPS um, things that we need in our buildings. And the other thing is, is the expense of taking our facilities department to pack it up and and get it to the location. So mm -hmm. I was under the assumption whichever organization is able to step up and say yes, we can use this. They'll help getting the materials out of there. Right. The sooner we get it out, we can make room for more um, storage. We can condense things, get things out to some of the schools. Mm -hmm. It's just we're paying to lease items that we – same with, like, you know, pre-buying. Pre-buying is great because we might save money, but we're also yeah, leasing a property to store stuff that we pre-bought to save money on. Right. So, again, it's just – you know, if we can't put them in our schools, and it's, it's good to have a little bit of a reserve, but if we're paying hundreds of thousands in storage and in metal containers and things like that, yeah. um, we need to really look at yeah, I agree. what we're paying to store stuff. And, you know, we've been storing them. So I just think to expedite things a little bit because we need to make room for other items. Mm -hmm. And if we can get some stuff off that floor, it, it might be less for us, um, you know, to, to rent it if we can remove stuff from that third floor and, and condense it to the second floor and the first floor, we can save a little bit of money until we figure yeah. out what we're doing. I agree. Um, I actually, last week, I actually, um, when we were at the last school committee meeting, um, Tobias had, had, when we again, we cleared out some of the other schools, we, we did a, a donation with a couple of organizations that came and picked up the, the books and then donated. So I've directed them actually to start looking out to those people, reaching out to those people, and 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 start the donation process. Because again, we, you're right, the manpower to to inventory all those things and pack them and stack them and do whatever else, it, it's tremendous. And um, like I said, hopefully we'll, I'm using this, this, the this custodians and craftsmen to start the, the Huntington, not not count books. Uh, so that's that's not what we we hire them for. We, they, we pay them a lot of money to count books. <laughs> So can we as a body designate someone to work with facilities to either itemize this for the committee? And we had approved, you know, to do we put this out there for the different organizations and have them submit a request? And it, it's not one of those, I can get it in January, February. Mm -hmm. First come, first serve, who can get this out of, right. out of our um, storage area? And then as, as things come along throughout the year, we can reach out to other organizations, but we just can't keep paying to lease items we're going to donate. Right. And it's not a small amount of money that we're paying. We're paying a lot of money to store stuff we're donating that can go towards something else. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Rodriguez. So um, everything that we have on that third floor, I know there was some stuff that were on pallets that were, <laughs> I don't want to say overpurchased, but could still possibly be used within the district itself. Right. Um, so wouldn't it be prudent if we were to take our, um, our principals across the district to walk that third floor prior to us deeming any of this stuff surplus to see if they would need any of this stuff? Because... I could just say if you know, if I, you know, depending upon what the school that I'm in charge of, there's probably some stuff there that they could probably use because maybe this this school didn't want to use this stuff and it's not good for them, but it's good for um, the other school. So I would, you know, if we can coordinate to make sure we can get, you know, district wide and have our administrators walk it mm -hmm. and see what's in there, what they can need, you know, what they need, or it's something that could be uh useful to them mm -hmm. you know for example i seen some of the uh weight equipment um gym equipment that was in there and i know um one of our um staff members uh what, the coach at west wells he he runs a program with the gym that could be useful for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know west junior high or any of the schools um, with some of those weights that are up there and um a lot of the other items so mm -hmm. if we can do that first Mm -hmm. um, have some of the administrators walk through that warehouse and see what they. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they see some things that they could be useful for them in their uh, in their buildings. 
Certainly. Uh, the the other thing to consider is again if we're depending on what we decide to do with the Huntington School, is the, there's it's a lot of the smaller desks and chairs that we will go into the Huntington once we finish the remodel. Uh, so and and I think again depending on what this body you know, full school committee decides to do, there are other desks and chairs for for, for older students as well. So a lot of that hopefully by again by the spring you know we. We we start to you know well it probably be spring probably in the summer when we actually start to you know put classrooms you know set up classrooms for the for the Huntington School. So are those because I know there was a, um, a large number of brand new desks right. and chairs. Where are we with circulating that, or we still didn't get well, there? I know I know we had some staffing um, issues of actually moving a lot of stuff, and we still do. But has that even moved yet, or are we still assessing? We've used some of them, again, because we had to set up the classrooms for the pre-K in, in, the, in the existing elementary school, so we moved some of that furniture into those classrooms, uh, but there's still a lot of furniture there. But we will, whatever we decide to do with the Huntington, we'll probably use a lot of that n new furniture when we remodel the Huntington. Okay. Thank you. I was going to say, I think, to Mr. Rodriguez's point, too, if we... If we couldn't even, if we couldn't get the administrators there, if we could at least produce a catalog for them of, of what is available and make that available to all the administrators so that they could look at it and, and put in a request for some of those items, that would probably be whatever's the, the fastest way we could get that done. Maybe that's something well, we could Or we could, doing. you know, the administrators or the, the senior custodians for the buildings, they, sure. they, they could certainly yeah, principal or designate the emissaries or for their administration. Sure. Okay. MSA said? So, Dr. Cobbs, you touched base on the, on the desks because I was going to mention that. And I know when I had asked, they said a lot of the schools, because of COVID, started using the tables. And um, so we still have a lot of the brand new desks. If we're going to use them for the pre-K, we have them already. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the way they have them set up takes up a lot of room. I'm sure if we got proper shelving in there or something, mm -hmm. we can we can consolidate so much. Mm -hmm. Just to just to clear out that third floor right. will be a hu will be a money saver. Um, and then. I agree with Mr. Rodriguez. Let's just put it out there to our put it out put it out there to our BPS staff, mm -hmm. our, our principals and and custodians. Have them just go there before we give something out. I mean, there, there's a lot of I saw some science um, science kits. There's a lot of things that were there. Um, you know, it might be they're using a different curriculum now, or they're using different books, but they might be able to find them useful or find find a useful someone within the community to get them. Um, so I think the sooner we get get them in there, it's just faster, because we've been we've been talking about this for a little bit now, and if we can just get this done before the end of the year. Yeah, I agree. I think if we can at least yeah get in there, get that catalog of what's available, offer that out to the faculty to the to the different schools, um, but maybe that's the other thing to consider too is we we want to move it, we want to get it out, and can those receiving schools like if it was gym equipment or something can do they have a place they can put it now can we start to move that process can can that happen between now and the end of the school year in june so that the faster we can consolidate it perkins said yeah if it would save us money it's worth doing that and if everything goes well and we end up using the huntington we could probably find a room down in the basement to store some of that stuff. Well, that you know, I, that's a good point because when I counted the classrooms for the Huntington, I, I did not count the basement classrooms. That you know, we, again, we're, right now I think we're using two two of them for the the uh, repair depot for the computers for IT. And no reason to move them if if we can. We don't need to use the basement for students. Uh, you know, the, the, we use the basement. The cafeteria and the kitchen is in the basement, but uh, it's a. And again, my donation center is in the basement. Hmm? The donations, my cradles to crayons. Yeah, no, we've, and you're in the basement been, as well. We've, but, we've but been there's, in the basement. There's still, <laughs> there's still four, uh, maybe six other classrooms in the basement in Huntington that could be used for. Whatever storage or, or anything else, so. it's it's a great space for storage, and I even yeah. have room yeah. in the back. Um, so it's, definitely it's ample access to that basin with the ramp that goes downstairs, and so it, it's easily accessible. Yeah. Okay. So the, again, the, the classrooms I counted were on the on the first and second floor. And a lot of the containers that we have, do we own those or do we rent them? We, the metal we, containers. We lease them. The storage, we, well, we both. We actually we own a lot of our, own, our storage containers. We we purchased a few uh, prior to the pandemic, but then we when the pandemic hit, we had to move furniture out quickly to change it up. So we 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 leased some of them. We've been in the process for the last two years of 
emptying them and, and, and turning them back in. And so I think we still leased about 12 of them. Uh, Do you know offhand what, what our lease is? I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have a ballpark idea. Um, I, I don't remember. It's been a while. Because again, I, I it's... I put my deputy hat back on for it's a second. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's just operation. that we're leasing, we're leasing to yeah. store. Yeah. And I know, I know some items, they're, they're not the... Um, most practical way of storing things yeah, because yeah. We're, we're trying to phase them temperatures. out. Temperatures, we're turning them in. Eat, you know, it, it's a slow process. To, you know, sometimes when people store things, they they want to hold on to them just because. Uh, and so, and a lot of them were the again the six foot table that we had two or three students at, and and, and if if you ever been to a school in the summertime when the tables are turned upside down and it's like <laughs> gum stuck to them, <laughs> like yeah, so it's better to put a lot of them in a dumpster. But it, it's hard to get some of the staff you know to get rid of them. Yeah, but that's yeah, they really probably shouldn't go back into the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, any other questions on item number four? Okay, item agenda. Uh, Next item, I'm sorry. Yes, it's okay. Sorry. Actually, do we need a motion to remove item number one and number two to a different yeah. date to postpone it? Mm-hmm. We're removing it from the agenda. So I wasn't sure if we needed yeah. to select a date for that too. So it, or just to remove it and have it rescheduled yeah. at a yeah, later date. Okay. So future yeah, so, date where we select. Okay. So then, um, right. So in 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 terms of um, taking those items out of order. I apologize for taking those items out of order on the agenda. So um, agenda item one um, was uh, initially listed as to go into executive session um, to consider the request in the Boys and Girls Club for access and utility easement in connection with potential purchase of a portion of property located at or around Keithfield and the value of such property and or requested easement. Um, We don't have our uh, attorney with us or uh, mem- membership representatives from Boys and Girls Club to have that discussion tonight. Um, could I get a motion to uh, move that agenda item to a future date to be determined by members of the subcommittee? Motion to um, reschedule to a later date item number one on the agenda as stated. Okay. And can I get a second? Second. It's okay. one and two. Yeah, we're going to oh, do that. Yeah, we're going to do them separately. I didn't know Second. if we had to do them separately. Okay. So item number one, um, motion was made by Ms. Hasek and seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. And can we get a vote? Show hands. All in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous. And then item two on the agenda reads, um, discussion of requested easement at West Elm Street for Keith Field site access to Boys and Girls Club proposed development. Um, so again, we would need a motion to reschedule that. And... Um, we should try and select a date in the coming weeks when we could get together and, and do that and invite members of Boys and Girls Club to present that information to us and to have that. Um, so can we get a motion to reschedule? Motion um, to reschedule item number two as stated. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. So motion properly made by Ms. Asak and seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. All in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous as well. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is other business. Um, do any members of the subcommittee have other business? Ms. Asa, please. I know um, we've attempted to start looking at our rental, um, our rental fees, mm-hmm. and it's just, it, it's crazy how fast time's going by. So we definitely need to at least start discussions on that, at least by the next meeting. Um, I believe, Dr. Cobbs, you emailed us mm-hmm. the application and some of the fees and stuff. Correct. Because um, I know we, we really need to look at that, especially with the cost of energy mm-hmm. between the, the heating, the buildings, the electricity, water, things like, well, the heating and the electricity, um, to just make sure we're competitive. We don't, mm-hmm. you know, we're renting out our, our buildings and stuff, but we just don't want to be losing money. It's costing us money to rent them out with our custodial fees and in the cost of I, I don't think honestly I don't think um, the 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 cost of the utilities are, are built in you know we we do try to recoup the cost for the custodians and if necessary school police um, for events but if you really start adding in the utilities it it, it would change significantly the, the rental fees it's just it might not I know I've come up to the high school I've gone to other schools whether it's during the week 
at night during, you know, or weekends. And I've seen some of our schools in use, but if it's costing us money, we really need to look at if we're losing money, it just, it's, it's not going to benefit us if it's costing us money to rent out our schools, or maybe we can just condense it and only allow certain schools Mm because there's other events already going on there. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, we can just add other events rather than have, you know, have it spread out throughout, throughout the district. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I definitely think that we really need to look at our, our pricing as far as what our rentals are. So, and I wouldn't mind, you know, just taking a look at that and then maybe having that for our next meeting to start discussion on that, mm-hmm. especially where the committee is going to be changing come January. Mm-hmm. So at least get something started. Make sure that's on the agenda. Yeah. Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> just to piggyback off Joyce's, um, our utility cost obviously uh, increases. Maybe you know the rentals um, has a, a impact on that, obviously, because they are using um, some of that. But you know, if we could actually, um, I mean, it's going to be a long. I, I have a quite a few items here. Um, I would like to, you know, if we could schedule this for our next coming facilities meeting to um, get an update on the Goddard School. Um, as well, I know we're using that as a community center um, to see what the cost is um, with the rentals there. There are groups that are u- utilizing that space that provide tremendous service to the city, um, but we need to make sure that um, we're not being um, bombarded by uh, letting them use that space and we could be using that for one of the, our programs. Um, also, if we can get a an update on the bus depot. Um, I know we're uh, I'm trying to, you know, moving forward on that initiative. And um, also I know we spoke about, um, I had brought to light the city ordinance regarding uh, what the parks department where the Brockton School Committee is in the um, overseer of certain parcels, um, but we still have the parks department permitting our fields Um, which is uh, against our city ordinance. So I know that um, Superintendent Thomas was supposed to um, move that um, forward. If we can get an update on that, um, maybe have a discussion with the Parks Commission and uh, Mr. Tim Carpenter as well. And then um, the turf fields, I know we had some um, engineering work on turfing, with track surface with the four middle schools in the Davis. If we could um, get that representative on board and um, so we could take a vote on it. I know there was there was money allocated, um, so we have to get a move on at least uh, addressing that, uh, you know, for our students. And lastly, um, I would like to get uh, an update um, on our contract with the Brockton Rocks organization of utilizing the Brockton Rocks, um, utilizing the high school as parking and what that contract entails um, uh, with um, BPS. Um, so that's about it. So the contract with the Brockton yeah, Rocks so specific I know to the use when, of the when parking they first, spaces? When the Brockton Rocks first originated, there was a contract with them utilizing um, Brockton, you know, Brockton High as source of parking, and you know what the fee was and what they paid to the district. Um, I know they've kind, of, you know, went to the Colgate League, but now that they do are going back into that minor league aspect, so um, they will be, and you know, obviously anybody that goes there, they're they're, they're they're parking here. So, what's the contract? What are they paying us or? Is this something that BPS is going to control? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it has to, this body has to um, oversee that. So, okay. I, I would echo Mr. Rodriguez's point about uh, the third point about the bus depot status as well. I think mm-hmm. we had also, um, I think the point had been raised too about the feasibility of maybe dispersing buses throughout the city in, in smaller numbers and like maybe the, the campus, uh, the, the compass schools, um, the middle schools, just to get them maybe in closer proximity to their roots. I know the question came up too about, well, what would you do with the dispatch or the, the staff and the office staff that are at the fairgrounds? And maybe we could consider, we could talk about whether or not there's another place that they could work out of. Um, 
where they could have telephone communication with those different sites what that would mean if that's a if that's a feasible option i know other towns that have their own buses do that because they have smaller numbers smaller fleets mm -hmm. and things but i know they keep them and store them at school sites um in the after school hours and things it's just we would have to look at obviously the logistics of parking and and where we could fit buses and things like that but that might also help to alleviate some of the costs associated with continuing to store buses at, at uh, the fairgrounds across the street so question i have with that is you know <clears throat> the the operation of it when if you spread them out and now we only have was it two supervisors how is that gonna be you know because they do have to do the safety checks and that the mm -hmm. buses are all in a line you have them all spread out through the city so how do they is that even possible are we gonna it will increase the cost. Um, we we when we started the transportation department, Aldo and I, we we hired a supervisor and, and gave him a, a vehicle to to that, that hit what part of his the major part of his job was to start the buses in the morning, make sure that everybody's ready and get out the yard on time. And with with satellite locations for buses, you, you're going to need more than one supervisor. So you're going to have a salary increase, you know, corresponding salary increase in benefits and another vehicle. And, and um, if it's four compass schools or if it's more, and, you know, the idea was to co-locate them close to where they the routes are, you know, where they mostly do their routes. But again, with, with three tiers, a lot of them are all over the city anyway. So... I'm not sure how much of a savings we'd realize by having them you know, disperse, you know, in satellite locations across the city, but we can certainly take a look at it. But there will be a corresponding increase in staffing to, to match, uh, again, to get out and, and, and vehicle purchase. And then they have the, uh, what is it? The snow room is that? Mm -hmm. the yeah, the snow 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 brush we call yeah, it. The brush in the top. Yeah. So, so it's just like you need you know, one of these locations now. Yeah, basically. Right. So, so now you're gonna have. So how much does that cost? And and you, and you have to you and know, the, the cost to wire it and set it up. So yeah, there's the associated costs that yeah, the, you know, to, you know everything's certainly on the table, but there will be associated costs with that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we and even if you couldn't do it with four different locations or th or three or something like that, I mean, I don't know if mm -hmm. that's worth doing a cost estimate of if you had, what would you save if you didn't pay it out to um, the fairgrounds? Or I know another, uh, I think it was a, a community member who spoke had asked about why we don't store them at the high school and, and all the parking lots around here. Mm -hmm. uh, considering it would, I think the assumption would be they'd already be out on their routes before the students are arriving and the, and the fact they arrive into park too. But yep. and, and there's also oh, associated security yes. costs. Yes, those, exactly. You know, police but then you patrols. added right, keeping staff them parking. So you're looking at, what, 160 vehicles that's going to be here on top. Mm -hmm. And then when they come back, where are they parking? Because right. now you have staff and students that are here. So when yeah. they return there's no place to right to some, park. some of the schools that you know wouldn't lend themselves well to because of the size of the parking lot like east okay. is, is really no place to put them um west you get a little more room um south yeah not so much um north not so much either you know we'd have to look at some of the you know a good location with a large parking lot would be the uh brookfield for example um Possibly Asheville, but there's so again, they're, they're way you know, kind of remote, remote locations. So, mm -hmm. you know, the feasibility, you know, we could certainly look at it and, and put together the feasibility study for it. So, the Shaw schools, would that be too? No, that'd be too small. I'm sorry, the Shaw, because the Shaw, uh, Shaw school on Quincy. Would that be a, a ideal location, like a temporary? Or, they I mean, they don't have much have of a parking lot there at the Shaw School. Yeah, you would have to grade yeah, it. Yeah, and, small. yeah, it's right in the middle of a pretty yeah. busy area, you know, down yeah. at th that intersection at the Shaw School. It, it's yeah. crazy any time of day. You know, kind of. mm -hmm. I was going to say maybe with lower enrollment at the high school, too, if you mm -hmm. don't have as many students driving to school or something, you might have those available spots for the drivers, the 160 extra spaces for the driver's vehicles or something. They might be able to find the spots if they moved it here. Um, sorry, Ms. Asek. It's okay. Um, so actually, Mr. Rodriguez touched base on one of the statements I was going to make. So sometimes people will mention things. We've already addressed this. We've already asked. The body has already asked about parking at the high school. And not only will you have your buses, you'll also have vehicles for the drivers. Um, we just don't have the space. And I know it was mentioned at our last full school committee meeting 
that potentially the high school, but I know a few of us have already brought that question up more than once mm -hmm. to try to figure out how we can save money as far as like a location. One option was to, okay, if you park the buses at the high school and you can make, make it work, then maybe find a small location for maybe shuttle the drivers over mm -hmm. um, to the lot. That way they're being shuttled and you, you have a shuttle back and forth uh, a few times a day. So it's, it's not going to be an easy fix unless we really find the space. We need, we need to find a transportation depot, period. Uh, and, and to that, be able to find the location. We, 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 this body actually wanted to put that question forward to the city council to, because it really is, you know, as you know, the city acquires the property, not the school department. And, we, you know, and there has to be some sort of resolution from this body, I think, to the school, the city council to move forward on it now. So you know, I mean, we, I, we, I know we looked at a property, which I won't discuss it. You know, obviously in open session, but uh, I'm not sure what has been done on it. Anything's been moving on that yet? Uh, it, it's been mentioned, but it, you know, I don't think there's been any real push to to, to come to a resolution on that. I mean, again, we we do have areas not too far from the school mm -hmm. that do have a lot of parking um, vacant areas, mm -hmm. but again, it, it's it's. A lot of times people will ask, and we're like, we've already asked. Same and with the people, solar panels. We've asked about it. solar panels for years, and it's why can't we add solar panels mm -hmm. to help with some of the energy costs, um, especially at the Downey School where that's all electric. Um, actually, do we have an update on the Downey? I, I know that they were trying to convert mm -hmm. to get away from the electric heat um, and things like that. Yeah, I can give you a quick update on that. Um, it, it, you know, we're, we're probably, I should say, Eighty to ninety percent through the engineering for the for the project. Um, we're we're at the point where we, you know I've, I've approved a lot of submittals for the new unit ventilators for the rooftop units. Um, we we right now where it's it's um, in the pre bid stage for the electrical contractors and, and the mechanical contractors. So they're they're actually doing their walkthroughs right now to so they can bid on the project. Um, we're we're about to put in the order I think soon for to purchase the unit ventilators and the rooftop units so we'll expect them mo the majority of the work will be done this summer we're actually going to take the building offline for the summer to you know get the, the most of the work done so so you know with the feasibility and with the study you know it it was we looked at going to converting to natural gas and we looked at the cost and, and there's no natural gas actually in that area other than maybe where the Shaw's and Home Depot is so and so the pipeline is down where the Massasoit campus is further down. Uh, so it, it wasn't feasible. It wasn't really a cost savings when you compare the cost of the energy. So we, we, the, the better aspect of the project was to go to more energy efficient electricity throughout the building, with not just the new unit ventilators and the rooftop units, but also the lighting fixtures, the, the transformers that are inside the building, the, the energy you know, occupancy sensors. Um, Pretty much everything electric will be changed out and upgraded to more energy efficient, so that we'll be realizing a savings. We, we looked at, we had actually submitted a proposal for a, a grant um, for the second phase of the project, which, which would have been to install a, a major solar installation on the roof of the building um, and, and, and get more energy efficient upgrades. So, we did. We're not successful with that that grant. We'll submit it again, but uh, so but that can be done in the next phase. We can get all the, the new upgrades installed and then do the energy efficiency um, installations later. So when when we don't get the grants, they they break down why we didn't get it. Yeah. This this was this was we we had a lot of people, a lot of experts help us write the grant you know, with the Amoresco people, and and they brought in experts, and and we it was really comprehensive, and we had to we went to several phases of writing and submittals and they gave us feedback. It's like, you know, you, you, you student in high school, you write a paper and you come, it comes back with a red D on it, you know, so it was, it was not fun. And we did a lot of work and, and, and uh, you know, our grant writing team worked hard, but at the end, you know, we still wanted them to give us what happened, why, what can we do better next time? So we will submit it again and we will follow up with that, that uh, for the next phase and that'll, that will, either offset or get us pretty close to net zero for the building as far as energy use and, and energy, you know, monies recouped for the uh, solar array. I mean, that, that's, um, I just know from everything I've been hearing on the news and stuff, I mean, hopefully they're not accurate, but mm -hmm. I'm hearing that 
we're going to have a really tough winter. Mm -hmm. And usually, I know the past couple of years, we were able to save on the energy costs. And mm -hmm. if we're going to have a tough winter, that's going to hurt us. Interestingly, uh, you know, again, I just signed last week, uh, you know, all the invoices for the electricity bills for every school. And, and interestingly enough, that that wasn't the most expensive school. <laughs> it was the Huntington building, actually. It's seventy thousand dollars for the Huntington bill. It was ten ten thousand dollars for the Garden building. So there's so there's so we're paying the ten thousand dollars for the <laughs> yeah. Who would think? But yeah, it. Uh, yeah. Again, we need to just really look at all all our buildings yeah, and absolutely. what our so, expenses are. And um, so, like, it was ten k just for the month, or is this for the month? For the guarded. <laughs> for the guarded. And I know, I know residential, um, you can reach out to the state and they come out do an energy assessment. Do they have anything for our buildings that we can reach out and have them come out, check the blown in insulation or, or, you know, energy efficient light bulbs and is there any program that we can look into? I mean, I can try reaching out to the state and see if there's anything they can come out and do an energy assessment. Not sure if they'll do it for free because it, 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 it's a little bit different going to a, a large building like a Look school building than it is a residential location. Um, probably the answer to the question is, uh, and that, again, that's what we did with the, the Amoresco group to, to, to we had a, a thorough you know, review of the, the Downey building and its energy use. And in fact, it will, it will require some electrical upgrades that's part of the, the project. Um, that, that's what we put into the package uh, for the next time. But. Um, certainly, we can look and look into that for each building, but it, you know there may be an associated cost with it. You know, again, if you let's just throw a number out, say it costs us five or ten thousand dollars for the assessment, and and we and then then they will not sure like at home they're not going to give you free light bulbs, and, mm. but there are energy programs that we have used, and they do give us the light fixtures, and they and they install them. So, you know, we've done that in several schools. So. Uh, you know, there is that. You know, we can. You know, I, I mean, think we've we've done a few of them already. I know we replaced light fixtures in quite a few of the buildings, and they were they supplied them and the contractors to do it. You know, but but there's a cost. You know, uh, yeah, definitely. When when you're dealing, um, mm -hmm. you know, with schools and stuff. They my my last in. question is, is I do get a lot of calls, um, a few calls, throughout the year, mm -hmm. um, and, and I always tell them. Sometimes they drive by and they're like, okay, all the lights are on at the school and it's like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, okay, but we have custodians there. Do we, I know when I've worked at some real estate companies, they set, they can, they can control the heating system, mm -hmm. the temperature of the heat, um, lights, sensor lights. Mm -hmm. So they come on when someone's walking, mm -hmm. um, rather than all of them stay on all we night do that. long. We've done that in quite a few schools, and we've done a, a lot of that through the Brockton High School, which obviously is the, the largest building. That the classrooms have full light sensors, and, and the cafeterias we've converted to light fixtures and have sensors. And so, uh, so yeah, we've we've done that in a number of, number of schools already. Yeah. Okay, because I was telling them, I'm like, this custodian's there, working late at night, but they're like, oh, the whole school's lit. And I'm like, well, yeah, they, I don't they know shut what to off tell you. eventually. Okay. Also. So thank you. You're welcome. And Mr. Rodriguez. I know in, now we get our um, UNIS updates with uh, Mr. Clarkson. Can we add that with our utility cost to, to that report on a, you know, I know it's on a monthly basis, but I would like to see the breakdown um, per school and, you know, the properties that we do lease, you know, what the actual cost we're paying um, per month. Certainly. Thank you. Because I know we see the overall, this is what we budgeted for, this is what we have left, but it'll be, uh, you know, I would like to see it. This is what we're paying for the Davis, this is what we're paying for North or South, that, you know, where we, what months are we uh, actually spending more and why? Yeah, that would definitely help if we were looking at energy cost, rentals. What, what, what do you want to see? The electrical, the uh, gas? Yes. Usage, uh, All utility bills. And obviously, water sewage, you know, we, we pay for water sewage. Yeah. Again, that that helps when we're yep. looking at what we're renting. Rental fees, yeah. A lot of times we're renting our facility, and sometimes it's cheaper for someone to rent our facility than to have them go out and lease a property. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times it's just if it's costing us more money, we need to, you know, 
-hmm. we have budget issues. We need to really like look at everything mm -hmm. and um, make better decisions when it comes to renting our facilities, um, especially if it's something that's going to be a repeat mm -hmm. renter. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we had asked for a list of those that rent on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I know we had asked for a list well, of that. Probably the, the largest usage for, for rentals for our facilities is from <laughs> Brockton Public Schools. For, you know, our after school programs, the community schools programs, and you know, the, the Brockton High School, it's, 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 it's never not used <laughs> pretty much, but it, a lot of it is used by community schools with the classrooms and, and driver training and different things. So, um, so there's, there's really probably like six schools that are used the most, and obviously this building it, it's, it has the most usage of all of them. Yeah, but yeah. but I, I think, do you get those reports from Delinda when she sends them out for the facility usage reports? No, we should though. I'll, I will make sure she includes you on those, those reports that come out. I mean, it's, it's when you look at the, um, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, Mr. Rodriguez. When, um, like what, you know, I, I rent, you know, Marciano Stadium for years. It's, this is what the fee is for, mm -hmm. um, like the house manager, the custodial staff, if you have a detail office, if they show up or not. And then you have the rental for the field we're using the lights. So is there, um, or is that like snowballed into that price? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or do we add a utility fee, uh, a set amount? Like how do you um, determine what the <laughs> utility fee is? Because you, know, you got the lights on, but then somebody's going to the bathroom, flush the toilet, and they waste mm -hmm. them all. So it's just like how do you come up with the yeah, magic you can number? probably take an, an average of the, you know, the daily fee and – Probably break it down to an hourly cost. I'd imagine for you, if you, it's probably not that hard once you get the the total number for, on the facilities usage, the utilities, and you know you could break each one down to an hourly fee. I'm sure, and, but it'd probably be quite costly. <laughs> but you get to an hourly fee that most people probably won't want to pay, or, or you know, organizations can't afford. No, it's it's more of like absorbing the cost. I mean, right. you know, just. At least you know what it's just, costing yeah, you. Yeah, cost, you know, right, for right? for example, it's just like listen, there's a seventy five dollar fee for utilities or one hundred fifty, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. something. At least we know we're not taking the brunt that we're getting something mm -hmm. um, that's dedicated to that, and where mm -hmm. that fee that's allocated to that rental is going towards um, our account that addresses mm -hmm, our mm -hmm. utilities to, you know, at least you know try to put a dent in there. Mm -hmm. Were you, sorry, Mr. Rodriguez and Ms. Ms. Hasek, were you looking for a specific timeline for those, um, the rental contracts and things? Were you looking for like the 22, 23 school year? You wanted to do like a one year review or were you just looking for like the, la the most recent quarter from? I would just, um, I would like to just see the 22, 23. Okay. For what we have right now um, to just get an idea and if that's, if that's something Zelinda can send to us, and mm -hmm. then when she sends them out, maybe whoever's on the committee can just see. 22 or 23, what specific <coughs> are you looking for? The, the rentals? for the Just our rentals. Um, by, by building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there's repeat. So, for example, my, my concern is, is if, if we can consolidate some of the rentals to maybe a few locations, mm -hmm. see where they are. Obviously, the PTOs, the PTAs are going to want to meet at their schools, but mm -hmm. if there's things going on, like I know there's a meeting going on at one of the schools because where we normally meet is um, it, it, there's a scheduling conflict. So I know that's a non-school related meeting mm -hmm. that's happening um, for an organization. So just ideas to see who's renting. Can we consolidate to, you know, keeping them in a, in a handful of locations? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if the buildings are already open and people are already there, we're paying that energy anyways and we're mm -hmm. paying that electricity. Right. Um, and typically, that's Brockton High School. <laughs> that's the one. It's you know you could probably consolidate almost all your meetings here at Brockton High School for whatever P, P, you know pack there is a PTO. But uh, you're right. They do they need to meet in the schools that their that their pack is is representing, or can they meet anyway? Yeah. I mean, it's nice for them to get familiar with the schools, and a lot of times there's things hands on. But, but a lot of times you can do that on certain nights, like parent nights, you know, the open house nights. You could, you could certainly they're going to be there anyway on the evenings. So. But you, maybe those consolidate those pack meetings to those same evening when they do the open house nights. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. So that's we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Dr. Cubs. Are there any um, any issues or anything that's come up in the first few months of the school year with any of the facilities, any of the buildings that you think we should be aware of or that we should report out to the committee as a whole? Any new items, new issues? Um, well, Mr. Rodrigo has already mentioned the garlic building, and it's mm -hmm, something that right. I meant to bring to this. It's on my list of a laundry list of things that going forward, you know, what are we going to use the buildings for? What's the best usage? And, and you know, that's a concern because I understand conceptually when when we created that, gave the space to the to that community center, it was supposed to be at North for a, a year or two when we had the building shut down and renovated. And that the pandemic shut that down fairly quickly, but so we then we work with the mayor's office for the guarded building for the community center. Um, but quite honestly, I need that building, <laughs> you know, and and that's just you know we we're looking at trying to put people in different places, and and it, it's something that you know I appreciate the work that they do for our students and and, and tutoring students and. Um, but they have the building all day long, all year long, and, and, and quite frankly, we can tutor our students just as well as anybody else can. All right. Okay, just. Yep, let's say something. Sorry, one last thing. Dr. Cops, uh, update on the auditorium. How are we coming along with the Brockton High School Auditorium? It's done. Oh, it is? Uh, so okay. we, 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 the students are using it again. They're, they're able to do their uh, drama classes on the stage. So right now, I think we have two dates for training and commissioning, um, the 24th, and I think the next one is in early November, like I think the 7th. So the lighting, everything's installed, ready to go. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's much brighter than it has ever been, but it, it, it's done um, for the most part, just the, just the commissioning and training. So I know we, we, we lost money on a lot of rentals for dance recitals, that I know. Mm -hmm. um, so many dance, re dance companies had to go outside and mm -hmm. um, rent. Are we going to reach out to them, let them know this is done, we're ready? For we those did. They, they've been inquiring over the summer, and Perfect. we told them it would be closed for the summer, but it, you know, we, we, we scheduled okay. October 2nd as the opening date to you finish. And we, we, did, we had a, the uh, custodian facilities crew over the weekend clean it up. So it, it, again, it's ready to go, and a lot of them inquire: Will it be ready for the summer, or the spring recitals? And no, thank said, you. Yes, we can go ahead. And so Linda's already taken some of the bookings for them. Perfect, because I actually, um, my nieces were in a dance recital, and we went to East Bridgewater. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful auditorium, but it's tiny, and they had Small. to do multiple mm -hmm. shows. And um, so I, it's rare to find an auditorium our size. Yep. And um, so We're as ready. long as we don't lose We're our repeat We're repeat ready to go. It's, it's beautiful. The lighting is, is, is amazing and, and the new technologies for the for the sound system and lighting system. If, if you ever get a chance to walk in there and see the new speakers, they're, they're, they're huge. But I, I can't. I'm waiting because I told them before I sign off on, on paying the last payments, I wanted to see a demonstration for the, the system and the sound. But I can imagine what the, if you saw the new speakers that are in there, um, they're like... There's like a rack of them that twice the size of these side by side and, and nice. they're like six feet tall. Um, and I can't imagine what it sounds like compared to two speakers sitting on the, on the stage. <laughs> you know, it, so the it, sound it, system that was here, did we take it to one of the middle schools? Um, it was pretty antiquated. The sound okay, because I thought we were going to like... Well, that's going to say the sound system that we had was two speakers on, this, on either side of the stage. Yeah, we can use them someplace else, okay. you know, it, but um, right now... Um, Okay. Yeah. No, perfect. I mean, yeah. th again, that's and, and actually what we did was exactly. It's a very great question, actually, Joyce. Is some of the lighting fixtures that we had, the stage lighting fixtures, we're going to take to other schools so they can they can use them. Can we get some over at the um, Ashfield? Um, I yeah. haven't had lighting we, we over have, there. And we have tons of them. We kept all the old fixtures. And, okay. you know, if right I can get now, some over at the Ashfield, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I know that they've th their stage has been needing some stuff so whatever we can get for the ashfield middle even the, the big you know like the spotlight you know the big machine we have brand new and two brand new ones or so the older ones are still living there to do something with so. perfect mm -hmm. and um so and again that's where some of our rentals that's we're talking about over ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars i know that was years ago when my nieces went to mm -hmm. denise buitt so I can't imagine what, what the rentals are now for some of the dance recitals because some of them do use it two, three days, oh, yeah. they, all day for two, three days. They and do. And then you have the summer, what, what do they call it, Lisa, the summer program, the, uh, the six. Oh, the six, drama club? Oh, Act 1, 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 Act 
So again, that's mm-hmm. this is that's like good rental yep. that comes so in. We're, we're back in business. We're, we're ready. Thank you. Certainly. Looking forward. Maybe before one of our meetings, maybe do yeah, a tour. See it. Yeah. yeah. I, maybe I in November. Arrange, arrange for a demonstration for you. Absolutely. Nice. Speaking of sounds, we need to look at the sound system at the uh, stadium. Oh, I, I know. Yeah, yeah that's. <laughs> Yeah, I just got to need to make an investment today. there. It, it it's died again, and we, you know, we, you know, the problem is, you know, at some point you're going to have to bite the bullet and spend the money for a, a upgraded sound system. You know, whether it, it's, I think the last price I got was twenty thousand dollars, which is not a lot of money for. Bad. This is, we 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 spend all the money on a new scoreboard, and and you know, we, then we go to Amazon and buy an amplifier to to do a patchwork on it. Yeah. We need to spend the money to install a state-of-the-art system and be done with it. Yeah. But we say $20,000, but there's a lot of people that will sponsor. There's a lot of companies that are out there that will sponsor. Yeah. And to have, you know, sponsor, put their name on a banner um, for, for that season, $20,000. And if we reach out, like, the, we cannot personally reach out. But if Brockton Public Schools reaches out and looks for sponsorships, Mm-hmm. That is like free money. Yeah. I know when we do that for our festivals and stuff, asking for the sponsorships, any any company. I know in my personal business, I, I, I sponsor, mm-hmm. um, and that's I, a lot of people want to help us, mm-hmm. and that's an easy way. Whether you can do a small amount of money or a large amount of money, if you're if you're a big business well, or you know, I, I understand that, but you know, at some point. Like I said, you know, I, I did operations for five years, you know, and we you know, we have a we have a budget. We, we have a quarter of a billion dollars school budget for this this school, and twenty thousand dollars is not a lot of money to upgrade the system and be done with it, and and, and we repair the roof so we don't get get these things leaked on and, and they burn out again. It's just it's just operations. It's something you need to do and get it done. You know, like we've done a lot of infrastructure upgrade to this 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 district. You know, that's that's a simple one. It's not that a lot, not a lot of money to get. And it that money's it. already allocated in the facilities. In uh, the, absolutely, we okay. send them a facility budget. It's within our, our budget. We just need to spend it. Okay. All right. Uh, I know. Um, are there any other any other items? And okay, I know next week on Tuesday, there's a um, policy subcommittee that we had put on our calendars. Um, policy manual or policy? Uh, I, think, I think at our last policy subcommittee, I think we talked about keeping the 17th open at 6 p.m. And I know at the prior subcommittee meeting this evening, I think you guys spoke a little bit about reconvening the uh, mm-hmm. safety and transportation. Um, the 17th is a parent advisory. It's meeting at the Red here, Cafe yeah. at 6 hmm? p.m. Yeah. Do we have, um, is there any other available time where we could reconvene and we could go over some of these um, rental contract histories or maybe get we could do an inventory and then we could reconvene. We could give an update about what we find for an inventory. Um, maybe if we can get that done before the end of October and we have an inventory all lined up, we could present that to the committee, the full committee in a November meeting time. Um, but I, I, th- I think I also I want to be able to go back and address um, the, the rescheduled dates, the, the one, items one and two with the uh, consideration of the easement for the Boys and Girls Club to keep that conversation moving too. Is, there, is the 24th a viable option? No. I think Mrs. Rivas Mendez um, scheduled okay. a tentative DEI, and I thought she scheduled an accounts review at our school, because I, I put DEI mm-hmm. on the 24th. Mm-hmm. Um, I could be wrong, but I put that in my calendar mm-hmm. for the 24th at 6 p.m. Yeah, I don't, because I don't I'm on that. that subcommittee, but then I thought she did an accounts review as well for that same evening. Okay, so if it's not 17th or 24th, we maybe maybe the members. Well, the 31st, we can, we're going to be giving out candy, we'll Mr. Be, Homer. We'll be busy on the 31st. So <laughs> we're going to be busy on the 31st, but we can try for the first. Yeah. If, if, if again, um, we might need a couple of weeks mm-hmm. to just you know get some answers on those two items that were on the agenda, mm-hmm. um, and then give the give the facilities department, give Zelinda some time to, and Dr. Cops to get us mm-hmm. information. So you, you're looking at the November 2nd, that's Tuesday, and nothing on that date right now. Yeah. 
November 2nd, the, the thir Thursday, Thursday uh, the first oh. is the Wednesday. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And then the following week, the 7th, is the election. Oh, yeah, that Halloween is the 31st. Right? Yep. So it pushes us pretty deep into what we're getting into the week right before um, Thanksgiving. Yeah, then, as, as a, if, if we kept to a Tuesday night, if we didn't consider a different night. To a different night. We just don't know what the, what the committee of a whole is going to be doing sure. as far yeah, as right. the um, now that they're looking to get the independent audit. We just don't know what meetings they're going to be scheduling. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the only wanna. thing. We want to make sure we have okay. Melinda set us, um, yep. give us an overall, yeah. what the, the schedules are. Okay, we can do that, and then we can. And then we'll see what's, um, what's open, because we also have um, dates okay. lined up for contract negotiations yes. with. Yeah. On the 20, 25th is Wednesday. Yeah, we're, yes. we're a couple of unions, so. Yep. Okay. But we just look at the whole calendar, yep. and then we just. Map it up from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we'll make a, a we'll make a posting for that. Once we have that squared away, we'll, we'll publish an agenda for that, and we'll get that put out so that everyone will I have think that access gives to that everyone an opportunity to get their sure. meetings in before the end of the year. Sure. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, then um, I think we can entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn made by Ms. Asak and properly seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. All in favor? And that's unanimous. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.